Thank you for joining us. We are using Zoom with the goal to foster a more inclusive environment and effective meeting. If you would like to comment during the meeting, please use the raised hand feature. Please utilize this tool to virtually indicate that you would like to speak in order to help the chair facilitate the discussion. A friendly reminder that this is a video conference and to please be aware of your surroundings behind you. All COAF meetings will be recorded and posted to the State Bar website. Zoom captioning is also available. To enable, select live transcript at the bottom of your Zoom screen, then select enable auto transcription. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Um, all right, well, it is my pleasure to call this meeting to order. And Elizabeth, if you would like to take roll. Okay. Um, Adebo Mneri? Present. Coleman? Present. Davis? Present. Higgins? Present. Hill? Here. Rhodes? Here. Richards? Here. Salcedo? Santoro? Rosie. Here. We have a quorum. Thank um, you. And then um, I, we also have some li liaisons joining us. Judge Dulcich, Gladys Valentine from CLA, and Pamela Enslin from California Law. Um, and then staffing, helping us staff today is Danielle, Shannon, and Kim. Um, and Donna's here as well. So. Hi, Donna. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Nice to see you all. Um, this is the uh, moment where we um, call for public comment. Um, as folks know, the State Bar has a um, process where you can provide a written comment before the meeting, or you can come here uh, and um, and provide some public comment. Um, I wanted to, to say on the record that um, we did receive public comment from uh, members of the public uh, during the time frame between our last meeting in uh, September and our meeting today. Um, that public comment, um, or those public comments, I should say, were not on topics that uh, were part of COAF's work plan or things within our purview. Um, they were forwarded, uh, however, to COAF members um, so I won't say much more uh, about those since they weren't within our purview. Um, but um, if there are people who would like to make public comment, we ask that you limit it to um, three minutes a person and uh, Shannon will help us time that. Uh, do we have anybody who wishes to make public comment at this time? Uh, yes, we do have one here. Okay, and before, um, before we take that public comment, can we uh, note uh, that Angelica is here for the record as well? Yes. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Angelica. Um, all right, um, public comment. Ladies and gentlemen of the Council on Access and Fairness, thank you for giving me the opportunity to address you today. My name is Todd Hill. And I'm here as a student who has faced a challenging journey through legal education. I'd like to share a story from my childhood, a lesson my mother taught me, and the reasons why I believe the conferral of my degree should be a real priority for the sustained body. When I was a child, my mother took me to the Holocaust Museum, a place that serves as a solemn reminder of the consequences of injustice and the importance of standing up for what is right. After our visit, we sat in the park eating ice cream, and she told me something I've never forgotten. Everyone can be wrong. Everyone can know they're wrong, and everyone can persist in the wrong for a protracted period of time. This lesson has stayed with me throughout my life, guiding me to question the status quo and advocate for justice when I see wrongdoing. I matriculated into the People's College of Law in 2019 with a deep sense of purpose, driven by a desire to make a positive impact in the legal field. During my time there, I discovered an unlawful scheme within the institution when it jeopardized the future of my fellow students and me. I believed it was my duty to report this misconduct to the appropriate authorities. I turned to the state bar, trusting in its commitment to public protection and its mandate as the sole regulator responsible post-secondary legal education services. However, to my dismay, the state bar failed to timely act on my report. I learned that there were policies in place that communicated to predatory schools that the state bar would not intervene in conflicts between students and their institutions. This policy, in my view, contradicts the core principles of the state bar's public protection mandate 
and is inappropriate for an entity tasked with overseeing legal education. In response to the state bar's inaction and the ongoing noncompliance of the institution, I have been left with no choice but to file a cause of action in federal district court. ID number 2-23-CV-01298-JLS-BFM. dash JLS dash BFM. Facts of the case are simple and clear, but the state bar has chosen to obfuscate and delay, seemingly in support of a school that has admitted to its noncompliance since 2017 and remains noncompliant to this day. I stand here today not only as a student seeking justice, but also as a symbol of the values the legal profession should hold, integrity, accountability, and the pursuit of justice. I implore you to consider my case carefully and prioritize the conferral of my degree. It is my hope that by doing so, you will not only rectify a grave injustice, but also reaffirm the principles upon which the State Bar was founded. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Uh, any other public comment, Shannon? Yes, and I'm allowing them to speak. Hi, can you all hear me? Yes, you can. Thank you. Uh, good morning, and thank you for the committee to for allowing comments on the meeting items for today. My name is Ansley Guthrie. I'm a recent UCLA, UCLA law graduate. I took and passed the California bar this summer. My comment pertains to the ongoing development of a portfolio bar examination for California bar licensure. I wholeheartedly support this proposal for many reasons, but one in particular is the financial relief this could provide to new graduates. Having just been through the process of taking the California bar exam, I can attest that studying for and taking this exam is a massive financial burden. The exam itself costs over $1,000 to take. The average cost of a commercial prep course is about $2,000. It's prudent to stay at a hotel near the testing center to cut out the risk of transportation issues, which for me cost over $600. Then to maximize the chances of success on the exam, you should be studying full-time without working for two months, paying for rent, groceries, and other expenses with no option to receive student loans. If you require an exam accommodation for a learning disability, the medical evaluation you have to provide costs over $5,000 out of pocket and is not covered by insurance. These expenses are shouldered by law students often coming out of school with hundreds of thousands of dollars of student loan debt. This is all to say the current exam process puts extreme financial stress on new graduates who are already undergoing the stress of an exam that determines your entire future in the legal profession. This is especially taxing for graduates going into public interest and government careers like myself, who in addition to taking a far lower salary than their peers in the private sector have normally worked unpaid internships during school, not getting the opportunity to save for the cost of the bar exam affected living expenses during the bar like their peers who had lucrative firm internships. Shouldering the cost of the bar exam effectively feels like more financial punishment for choosing a public interest career. Having the option of a portfolio bar exam could be a game changer for graduates choosing this path. That's why I feel it's vitally important for the state bar to develop and roll out this program. I was pleased to see that the proposal mentioned prioritizing students who have accepted public interest positions in the initial cohorts for this program. However, I would urge any further proposals to add a requirement that post-grad positions allowing students to create a bar po portfolio be only paid positions, no unpaid volunteer programs. Graduates working in these positions deserve to be paid for their work, even if it will be used to gain entry to the bar through a portfolio exam option. It is simply unrealistic in today's economy to continue expecting graduates to live on zero income while they wait for bar admission, in addition to the massive cost of the exam and preparation courses. Continuing to do so only perpetuates existing class divides in the profession, favoring those who come from wealthier backgrounds and have outside financial support while studying please consider adding this requirement to any future proposals. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Guthrie. Uh, any other public comments, Shannon? There's one person I want to speak. Good morning, council members. My name is Kendra Muller. I am commenting on behalf of Disability Rights California, which I am a civil rights attorney of. Uh, our comment is regarding the PBE agenda item. We greatly appreciate this council's evaluation and encouragement towards alternative pathways to licensure. The history of this legal field's 
subjugation and marginalization of certain populations is well documented in the evidence and causes harm and has continued to cause harm to disabled people, LGBTQ individuals, people of color, women, first generation applicants, and many other marginalized groups and individuals with multiple identities regarding these groups. The, we strongly support the recommendation of the initiatives to pursue these programs and increase diversity in the legal profession. And we recommend that the bar continue to conduct research and advocacy regarding alternative pathways. We thank you again, and we look forward to the discussion today on that agenda item. Thank you, Ms. Muller. Any other public comments, Shannon? There are no more public comments. Thank you to those who made public comments. Moving on in our agenda, um, Elizabeth distributed the minutes from our meeting on August 25th, uh, 2023. Does anyone have any comments or edits to the meeting minutes? I see none in this room. I see no hands on the screen. Okay, then um, could someone please make a motion to uh, adopt the minutes? So moved. Thank you, Yemi. Someone second, please? Second. Thank you, Michael. Elizabeth, could you take a roll call vote, please? Sure. Thank you. Uh, Adepo Mary? Yes. Coleman? Yes. Davis? Yes. Higgins? Yes. Hill? Yes. Rhodes? Yes. Richards? Yes. Salceda? Abstaining just because I wasn't part of the last meeting. Santoro? Rosie? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Um, so this is the, the part where I get to um, talk for a minute. Um, I just want to say how nice it is to see everyone in person um, and and on the screen. Uh, we have uh, some new members with us uh, who are now uh, full members of COAF. The last time some of you were here, you were just watching on the screen. Um, so uh, why don't we take a minute um, and, and Helica um, missed the last meeting, so let's go around. Uh, starting with folks in this room uh, and just introduce ourselves and then um, I'll make sure that we uh, get to introduce our new liaisons as well. So uh, Shalak, do you want to start? Sure. Hi everyone, my name is Shalak Richards. I am, are we saying our... I'm in legal education. Yes, you can say that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I went into the default introduction and was like, wait a second. I'm in legal education. I have had the pleasure of being on co-op for, this is my third year, I think, which time <laughs> flies. Um, and this work is some of the most meaningful that I think I've had the pleasure of doing. So thank you for the opportunity. I'm Michael Rhodes, I'm the vice chair. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. I'm currently a superior court judge in San Francisco and I think it's been three years as well since I've been on, on this committee. Really appreciate the work and the folks that are doing it. Hello, I'm Tristan Higgins. My pronouns are she, her, and I am a diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant down in San Diego. I'm brand new and very, very excited um, to be here. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Yemi Adebo Mary, and uh, this is my first year as a member of the council. I'm a transactional entertainment and technology attorney, and I'm currently the vice president of legal and associate general counsel for streaming platform centers. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Jazarel Hill. Um, I am a full-time associate clinical professor of law just down the street at Loyola Law School. Um, so really excited to be here and to jump in and get started on this work. Can you introduce yourself? I'm, I'm you're, the, you're the most important person no, here. No. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Hom. Yes. I'm primary staff to the council. Um, I've been with the state bar for about six years now. Um, and 
uh, really enjoyed working with all of you. I think doing uh, very important work and uh, getting a lot done. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, Kristen Rosie. I'm the chief judge of the California Department of Insurance, and uh, I am on my second year of, of uh, chairing COAF. You know, COAF is a, a, a four year term unless you um, can't get your uh, degree in four years and you have to take a fifth year, which is what I'm doing. Um, so I, I, I stayed on a little bit longer because I um, couldn't bear to leave this group. Um, so I'm excited to be here with all of you. Um, Shannon, you're the first on our screen, Shannon, so I'm gonna point to you. And I'll just name people because that way it'll be easier. So, so Shannon, you're first. I'm um, a program coordinator with the Office of Access and Inclusion, and I've been at the State Bar for four years now. Uh, and Tara. Hello, everyone. My name is Tara Davis. I am a Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at uh, Kenobi Martins, a law firm in Irvine, California. I have been on call for just less than um, a month now. I'm one of the newbies, and I go by the pronoun she, her. Roll. Hi, my name is Raul Dran. I'm Assistant General Counsel in the Office of General Counsel for the State Bar. Um, I use he, him pronouns, and I've been at the State Bar for about a year and a half now. Judge Dolchich. Hi, I'm Judy Dolchich. I am the liaison from the Judicial Council's Advisory Committee on Providing Access and Fairness. I'm a judge in Kern County Superior Court. Um, this is my second year as a liaison. Sorry I couldn't be there in person. The trial schedule just wouldn't allow it. I go by she, her. And Danielle? Hi, my name is Danielle McRae. I'm a lead program analyst in the Office of Access and Inclusion um, and help with work on a lot of our DEI work um, in, in support of and in partnership with COAF. I've been with the State Bar two and a half years now um, and loving it. And I use she, her pronouns. Um, Donna. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I'm sorry I couldn't be there with you in person today. Uh, my name is Donna Hershkowitz, and I'm the Chief of Programs and Legislative Director here at the State Bar. Um, the Office of Access and Inclusion falls within the, uh, within the Programs Division, and in past years, I spent a lot of time um, with COAF. Um, unfortunately, due to a sort of a shift in my portfolio. Um, the past year and a half or so, I have been focusing on some other issues in the programs area and haven't had the pleasure of joining your meetings. Um, I am glad I could be here this morning. I'll be talking with you um, about, I think the first substantive item on your agenda, the uh, portfolio bar exam. Thanks, Donna. We miss having you here. Novella. Hi, I'm Novella Coleman, pronoun she, hers. Uh, I think this is my third year with COAF and I am an assistant chief counsel at the California Civil Rights Department. Uh, and I'm gonna go to Pam next. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Pamela Enslin. I am a liaison and I am the executive director of California Law Pathways. Happy to be here. Angelica. Hi, good morning. Angelica Salceda, I use the pronouns, and I'm the Director of Democracy and Civic Engagement um, at the ACLU of Northern California. And I believe this is my um, second year, and apologies again for missing last week's, or the last meeting, but good to see you all. See you. And Gladys, you are uh, the newest uh, liaison, and so I'm going to give you a chance to introduce yourself and um, since we haven't met you yet. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you all and I see some familiar faces. Um, my name is Gladys Valentine, she, her pronouns. Um, I am here as a liaison for the California Lawyers Association. Um, I'm an initiatives manager, so I specifically support with diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, our civics, education, and outreach programs, health and wellness programs, and law school student outreach. And, and welcome to you all. 
It's nice to nice to meet you. Thanks for for joining with us. We're always happy to have CLA folks here. Um, so I don't really have much of a report. I, I did want to take a moment though, um, um, because we are the Council uh, on Access and Fairness, I feel like it's important to take a moment um, to just talk about and mourn the, the passing um, of Justice O'Connor uh, today. Um, uh, you know, Justice O'Connor, um, obviously the first woman on our, on our country's highest court, but um, really broke down barriers for women and other underrepresented groups um, on the bench, not just the Supreme Court, but, but nationwide. Uh, and it was uh, really not that long ago that she graduated from law school uh, and couldn't get a job at a law firm. Um, and um, so I just wanted to, to, to take a moment to, to, um, to talk about that and, and uh, give us just a, a second to, to think about how much um, she meant to, the, to uh, the legal profession and the judiciary in this country. And so um, with that, Elizabeth, do you have a director's report yeah. for us? Yes. Um, so I uh, I did want to note that Sarah Good, who's our liaison from the Board of Trustees, um, uh, sends her regrets that she's not able to join us today. She had a, a prior commitment. Um, uh, and I also wanted to report out on um, uh, uh, COAS participation with the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission's Law School Fellowship Program. Um, as some of you may know, the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission is a sub-entity at the state bar that um, oversees uh, grants to legal aid organizations in California. Our office um, helps administer those grants, um, and we fund um, about 100, or 110 organizations throughout California. Um, for su summer 2023, there was a uh, law student fellowship program to fund law students spending their summers at legal aid. Oftentimes uh, in legal aid programs, uh, you're volunteering for free in the summers, which is very hard uh, for students. Um, and so um, to um, address DEI issues, as well as recruitment and retention in legal aid, um, the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission was able to um, uh, direct some of their funding towards these summer fellowships. The uh, Legal Services Trust Fund Commission um, kindly invited members of COAF to participate on the review team for these grants. Mm -hmm. um, and so we just concluded the 2023 grants, um, which uh, uh, were very well received by the law students, by the legal aid providers, and as well as by law schools. Um, we we um, received a lot of um, very, very positive feedback about it. Um, and so for 2024 summer, we're uh, in process of that review right now. So thank you to Kristen and Novella for your very hard work over the last several weeks in reviewing. Uh, we received um, uh, 34 applications requesting $1.65 million to fund 170 fellows. However, we only have about $759,000 in, uh, in funding. So mm -hmm. there, were, there are going to be some very hard decisions made uh, by that committee and then by the Trust Fund Commission. Um, so I just want to provide that update that um, that is ongoing, um, and again, appreciate uh, Novella and Kristen's time on that. And yours. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and yours, because you should be writing that report right now, and you're uh, doing this instead. Uh, no. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, any uh, questions for Elizabeth on on uh, her report? All right, seeing none. Um, Donna, would you like to um, start our discussion on the um, portfolio bar exam, future of the bar exam, et cetera. Absolutely. Um, I know you all had a robust discussion at your last meeting um, about the uh, proposal. And so what I'm here to do today is not to revisit that, um, but rather to give you an update on the action that was taken by the board of trustees um, two weeks ago at their meeting. Elizabeth attached to your agenda the, um, I believe, the agenda item um, that, uh, that went to the Board of Trustees, which um, described the public comment that was received, 
described the uh, proposal, um, uh, the PBE proposal, um, which is the same version of the proposal that, that was presented to all of you. Um, and the Board of Trustees um, acted to recommend, um, uh, to, to ultimately recommend that the Supreme Court adopt the pilot portfolio bar exam um, as a method for assessing a candidate's minimum competence to practice law. The board recommended that the pilot um, be um, comprised of the 120 or so individuals who are who remain in the the original provisional license provisional license sure program, um, and that it apply to everyone in the program. Um, I I point that out because the um, proposal for the full uh, portfolio bar exam would be limited to. Um, students who completed the nine subject area doctor doctrinal courses in law school and also would be limited to those attending an ABA approved law school or a California accredited law school, not registered law schools. Um, for the pilot PBE, the board is recommending that everybody who remains in the, the original provisional licensure program um, and those are folks who could have been in the program since uh, late November of 2020, um, that they um, that it apply to all of them who still remain in the program. Um, as you all probably recall, the original provisional licensure program was for those law students who graduated or became eligible to sit for the bar exam, first became eligible to sit for the bar exam in um, 2020. <clears throat> and so it was a way to address those essentially, uh, largely those who graduated um, from law school during the pandemic, and for a, a, a slew of reasons, might be unable to um, take the bar exam, right? They may have been, become the sole <clears throat> income earner in their household. They may have been um, in a household with you know, eight people in two bedrooms and didn't have the ability to study and didn't have the ability to go elsewhere to study because it was the early part of the pandemic and nothing was open for them, um, or just did not have the um, the ability to demonstrate minimum their minimum competence on the bar exam. Um, so we created this, uh, this program that allowed them to work as provisional licensees, but ultimately required them to still take and pass uh, the bar exam in order to get admitted. Um, that program has been extended a couple of times and expires December 31, 2025. And so this cohort of 120 or so remaining provisional licensees seem like a good way to pilot the program. It would be a small controlled pilot um, uh, after which um, staff, representatives of the Committee of Bar Examiners and experts would provide recommendations to the State Bar Board of Trustees and the Supreme Court um, of, uh, on what to do with the program, how whether to expand it, if so, how to expand it? As would it be a full full sale opening up of the program, or or phasing in um, new groups that would be eligible for the program um, to slowly scale the program up? Um, um, and uh, and then and the Supreme Court would ultimately make the decision on whether to um, continue this portfolio bar exam as a method for um, determining minimum competence. As I think you all know, this is this would be an option. Um, ultimately, um, people are um, the the bar exam would still exist, and we fully expect that um, that there will be a significant portion of individuals who will continue to take the bar exam as their pathway to a law license, and that others um, would opt for um, the um, the portfolio bar exam um, as their pathway um, to licensure. Um, we uh, staff um, are putting together um, the letter to transmit the um, the proposal to the Supreme Court. Um, I expect um, the uh, transmittal to be submitted to the court either today or Monday, um, after which um, the court could act on this proposal along with the original recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Commission 
on the bar exam uh, and what that's going to look like in the future, they could act as early as um, as January. Um, and we are certainly hopeful um, that they do, since they are considering both of these proposals together. And depending on what the court decides on the bar exam, we most certainly need to get our act underway in um, potentially developing a new California bar exam um, uh, uh, quickly. So with that, um, uh, I figured sort of the best thing I could really do today would be to answer your questions. Um, uh, and so I'm gonna, gonna turn it over to you to ask me any questions that you have about the board action or next steps. Thanks, Donna, uh, and I appreciate you um, being here to take questions. Um, does anybody have uh, questions for, I know for, for those who've been here for a while, we've been talking about this um, really for years. Um, the Blue Ribbon Commission started uh, almost, has it been three years? It might have been three years at this point. Um, time really does flash a lot, you're right. Um, <laughs> Uh, so we, some of us have been talking about this for three years, and I know some of you, um, you know, just got an earful in our meeting in August um, when when we took it up, uh, sort of in in earnest. Um, but are there questions from uh, from COAF um, members about about what Donna has to say? No one. I actually, I'm just wondering if. Uh, you know, potential employers will know um, how you came to pass the bar and what, if any, value we th we think that there may be in shielding that information or what the plans are around that. Just curious about the thoughts around that um, possibility. Sure. So it 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 is it is not the state bar's intention to indicate um, the path to licensure that any licensee took. Um, so if it's bar exam, if it's um, if it's through provisional licensure, or if it is through this portfolio bar exam, um, it, you all of these are ways to determine your minimum competence. Uh, if you get admitted through any of these pathways, you are a lawyer in California, you are a licensee of the state bar, and your profile would simply reflect that you were a licensee of the state bar. Yeah, I mean, although I, I will say that that was one of our concerns at, at, on the Blue Ribbon Commission and at, and COAF was um, nothing stops anybody from asking. Mm -hmm. um, and um, if you, and, and it might be apparent from your resume that if you did the portfolio, um, that that would somehow appear on your resume um, as an indication, and that it would create a, a two tier system, um, which ultimately may not um, benefit the folks that um, we were the portfolio exam is intended to to help. So that that was that was one of the concerns that we outlined and that COF outlined in in their uh, letter to the board of trustees. Shalak. Um, thanks so much for being here, Donna. I have a question about the the proposed steps after the pilot, because it seems to me that from the way this is phrased, it's happening. <laughs> like the pilot, and then it's like from the pilot, just how it gets phased up. I, I don't know, maybe I, I that could be too simplistic. But you mentioned that right now with the pilot, it would be open to those who were already in the provisional licensure program. And then part of the conversation in rolling out and who it would be like open to after is ABA graduates of ABA accredited schools and California accredited schools only. Um, is there any contemplation about how this would interact with the, the first year law school exam that those who, I mean, everyone's presumptively does, but ABA accredited school students are assumed if they pass that first year successfully by the school standards to have met. Is there is there a conversation, a question about how those things may or may not interact? What type of scores might be needed on the FYLSE to qual to determine 
I saw that there were questions about minimum competence, um, which we can have separate conversations about whether well, current bar read that really measures competence. <laughs> That's, I think, a separate conversation. But I'm wondering if any type of interaction between the FYLSE and the portfolio bar exam might be examined in rolling this out. I, I apologize if that wasn't a fully thought out question. <laughs> no, 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 there's, there's a lot in there, Shalak. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me start just by being crystal clear. There is no portfolio bar exam, pilot or otherwise, until the Supreme Court makes a decision on whether or not to authorize it. I wanna be crystal clear about that. The Supreme Court has to author, authorize pilot, pilot or not. Um, and then ultimately, um, again, if the Supreme Court authorizes the pilot, they will have the opportunity to decide whether or not um, the experience of the pilot suggests that there should be an expansion, a continuation, or an elimination of the portfolio bar exam. So I wanna be crystal clear about the authority of the Supreme Court um, uh, with regard to that. Um, uh, and, and I think one of the things that we will, so there are a lot of things that we're going to need to develop during the pilot, um, which would apply for the full, uh, any any expansion of the program, right? We're going to need to develop a clear list of the components of what makes up the portfolio. We're going to need to develop rubrics for grading. We're going to need to develop a plan for um, for hiring and training graders a plan for uh, where you need to develop training for supervisors. Um, um, but because we're using a cohort of people who already have supervisors, one of the things that we don't have to be particularly concerned about in the pilot is how to help people who don't have connections um, in uh, the legal community get a supervisor. That's part of what we would need to do, and I'm sure one of COAP's concerns um, for any expanded pilot is, is some kind of matching program, something that does not end up disadvantaging um, first gen, people of color, women, right? people who may not have the same kind of access, um, people who aren't top 10% of their ABA law school. right? Um, and, so, and so that would be something that we would have to develop for the future. We'd also need to look at um, scaling, a uh, scaling up, and how would we do that? So it could be that that staff does this pilot. We do this pilot, and staff believes that the pilot is successful by based on metrics that get determined for what that would look like, what success would look like, and so we recommend uh, uh, expanding the program. But perhaps we don't think we're yet ready to just open the doors to every ABA um, and Cal accredited, um, California accredited law school graduate. Maybe we want to phase it in and we start with um, uh, public interest because there is a, um, there is significant support for the portfolio bar exam in the public interest sector. These are, there are a hundred plus organizations that we have relationships with that we we provide IOLTA funding for and we have we monitor um th through that IOLTA fund for the IOLTA funding and their equal access funding. So that could be a cohort. The legal aid community has indicated interest in partnering. So right, so it could be that we that that becomes the first cohort after a pilot. Again, all subject to Supreme Court approval. I'm going to assume you will all put that caveat subject to Supreme Court approval at the end of everything I'm saying and I won't keep saying it. Um, I saw a smile there from Michael. <laughs> so, um, so, um, so, or it could be that we decide, you know, and that might be a good way to test matching, um, any matching program that we come up with. Um, it may be sort of the, the best way to roll it out. I don't know, right? We'll learn more as, as this goes on. It may be that we're, we want to roll it out to public interest first, then government, then private. Um, as a way to, among other things, maybe build the confidence in the in the private bar um, about the program and the um, skill sets of the participants in the program, or it may be that that it seems to make sense to roll it out um, entirely. Um, 
So that so that's sort of what it looks like, and that goes Shalak to your uh, one of your questions about the ABA grads and the um, and the Cal grads. When it comes to the relationship between um, between the program and the first year law students exam, it's not actually something that that we've had a lot of um, communication about um, or conversation about, in large part because eighty five percent of the people who take the first year law students exam are from the unaccredited schools and they are um, uh, under the design, the recommended design of the program, they are not recommended to be participants in the um, in the portfolio bar exam. Um, and, and that ties back to the requirement that that all participants take the nine doctrinal subject matter area cl uh, classes and successfully complete those classes. And I think the, um, the alternative pathway working group felt that there would be greater confidence in the knowledge and the, the content knowledge learned in those classes if those were classes delivered in uh, ABA approved law schools or California accredited law schools. Um, so that's where that limitation came from. So I don't imagine that there would be a future sort of decision to tie um, pass rate or uh, score on the uh, first year law students exam to the program. Um, I think the feeling would be if you if you pass the first year law students exam, right, for that 15% of the people who take it beyond those in the unaccredited schools, um, then that is the determination that it is appropriate for you to proceed to your second year of law school, to your third year of law school. If you graduate from law school um, of in a law school of the, the types we mentioned, then you would be eligible for the program. So, so it's an it, it's an interesting question that that I hadn't really thought about, and it's um, certainly one I'll I'll sort of raise to make sure that there aren't other issues that that we're missing with that. Um, but I don't. Off the top of my head, I don't envision that being a um, consideration. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. Justin? Yeah. Um, hi, Donna. Uh, my question really is around the Blue Ribbon Commission's inability to make a proposal and then mm -hmm. the working group's ability to make a proposal. And so what I am wondering is what will the Supreme Court have in front of them as they, and also, is that just Chief Justice Guerrero making that decision? I mean, um, what are they going to have access to? Because you know, COAF was opposed to this and wrote significant, you know, objections, and I don't believe any of those have been addressed, um, as well as the Blue Ribbon Commission's, con you know, concerns, which was a much larger group, I think, than the working group. And I'm just curious, what will be presented to the Supreme Court for their decision? Absolutely, great question. So the Supreme Court will have in front of it um, the full report of the Blue Ribbon Commission um, that was uh, uh, um, transmitted after uh, the board approved that report in May, in May of 2023. That report includes a discussion of every motion um, and the vote uh, the vote on every motion. It includes the it included includes information that was presented to the Blue Ribbon Commission on the alternative pathway, but makes crystal clear that the Blue Ribbon Commission made no recommendation that the Blue Ribbon Commission could not muster a majority either in support of the um, an alternative pathway nor opposed to an alternative pathway. So the court very much has that information. Um, the and uh, and it is the court. It is not just Justice Guerrero. This will be something that is considered by the court in its entirety. Um, they will also the the court will also have in front of it um, the report of the alternative pathway working group, the proposal, um, as well as all of the public comment, the twenty eight hundred plus public comments that were received on the proposal. Um, which we have um, uh, in the agenda item that was posted for you all today, there is a link to a dashboard that contains all of the public comment and the breakdowns of that public comment. Um, and so the court will have all of that information as well. Um, and so the court should be, it will be able to be very well, well versed in 
the um, opposition uh, that COAF submitted, the um, questions that came from a variety of members of the public, those in support um, and the, the opposition as well. Um, so I do think they will have sort of a comprehensive set of information, not just on what to do on the bar exam, but whether or not to, um, to support a, um, a, a portfolio bar exam. So at the, uh, thank you. Um, at the end of your comment, you said they will have the COAF letter, but I didn't hear you list that in the original stuff. Did I misunderstand? It, they, they will get the COAF objection? So I think there's a co-op letter, um, I think, from uh, into the original um, BRC report. Um, and I believe, and I'm sorry, I don't have off the top of my head. Um, I don't recall if co-op submitted formal opposition um, to uh, the alternative pathway you did. Um, so then any of that, any of that will be part of what the what the Supreme Court receives. All right. And, and if I may, um, is there going to be any kind of discussion with the Supreme Court or is this something that happens sort of behind closed doors? Um, typically Check what that. happens um, is um, the Supreme Court uh, does not hold a public hearing uh, on this. They have they um, decide this during one of their um, closed door administrative conferences. All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. and, and and yeah, let me just add to that and then Michael. Um, and Jezreel, your question was answered, right? It was. Okay, yes. great. Thank you. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to add to that piece is that there was um, a non-voting um, sort of member of the BRC who was there on behalf of the Supreme Court. Um, and so the Supreme Court had someone at every meeting um, who wasn't a voting member, but was um, somebody who, you know, heard all of the information um you know provided comment you know made suggestions things like that um not obviously one of the justices but a member of the supreme court staff that that was there so they, they it won't be new information for them hopefully michael thank you donna i would appreciate it if you could address the public comment i think you were here for the public comment question or issue that was raised about compensation for folks okay. that are participating in the portfolio bar exam. And yes. this might be a way to address to the more broad question of the process, because at least as I understand it, the recommendation is that people be paid, but that the, the working group didn't feel strongly. And <clears throat> essentially we're suggesting that it go forward even absent a compensation requirement. Maybe I have that wrong. So if you could clarify, I'd appreciate that. And also in clar in clarifying, clarify what the process will be for, is it the Supreme Court making that decision uh, specifically? How specific is the uh, plan going to be? Because it seems like there are some, some things that are left open, at least in the recommendation from the working group, and whether that will be left to the state bar or whether those are specifics that the Supreme Court will nail down, if you know. Yeah. Um, so the recommendation is, in fact, that um, that uh, to avoid sort of the risk of abuse, um, that that the um, that the candidates be compensated, um, so that there would be a minimum level of compensation set. I think the report recommended that it would be the level of compensation that an organization would be paying to law school graduates who hadn't yet passed the bar. Um, and, and so that's something that we had talked about. Staff raised that issue during the Blue Ribbon Commission as well, wanting to make sure that there was compensation um, for the work. Um, and there were, Michael, um, a number of issues that um, you know, the, the Alternative Pathway Working Group um, created a, a, a really strong framework um, but there are a lot of issues that that still need to be decided. And in fairness, they had about 60 days. Um, but um, they also felt like this is the job for the person, the group that will be sort of doing more of the day to day implementation. And so, for example, the recommendation to the court, um, the recommendation in the in the report is that the um, that there be that the set number of hours that the candidate have to um, perform would be somewhere between 700 and 1000. Obviously, that's not going to be up to the candidate. We'll need to select um, the exact number of hours. Um, there are 
a number of other things, um, which uh, some of which we laid out in the agenda item, um, decisions that still need to be made, things that need to be fleshed out. We need to set a cut score. Um, for um, for the for the portfolio because what's envisioned is that the somewhere between eight and thirteen again something that is that is an unknown um, uh, uh, components of the portfolio bar exam get graded um, as a whole um, and uh, somewhat like the bar exam where if you score better on one it will help offset maybe your weakness on something else they would all be scored together and there would have to be a pass line that is set. Um, we expect that the court may want to participate in some of those decisions and may defer to the state bar on others. Um, so our sort of to-do list um, in what we um, have indicated in a draft of our submission to the court, um, is sort of we identify the types of decisions that need to be made. And what we propose is that the state bar staff will work together with, um, with experts and representatives of the committee of bar examiners to flesh out some of those missing items to the extent that rules need to be developed. Those rules would obviously need to be approved by the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court could say, yes, we'd like you to come up with recommendations on each of these specific things. And we'd like you to come back to us and tell us what those recommendations are before you launch anything. What we envision is that, that um, if it's approved by the Supreme Court, um, we would develop all of the necessary pieces of the, um, all, we'd make all those decisions and develop all of the necessary um, pieces of the proposal, including the rubrics for grading the components of the um, portfolio, that we would do that in 2024 and it would launch um, for 2025. And so there'd be time to go back to the Supreme Court should that be their preference um, to get some of those, some of those more in the weeds specific determinations. Um, approved. Thank you, Donna. That's that's really helpful, and I, it's the specifics matter so much to what mm -hmm. the program could be, and I think you laying that out is really helpful to my understanding and everyone's understanding of the many more steps that it's going to take before anything is really launched. Yep. Great. Thank you. Uh, any other COF uh, member have question or comment? So my question earlier was about um, kind of jumping off your question about how supervisors would get on board and inform. But Donna, thank you so much for all this background. That's really helpful because you already answered my question. Perfect. <laughs> Glad to hear it. Seeing uh, none, Donna, I would just ask um, the following, and that is that um, whatever happens next, that and whatever working groups or um, committees or whatever other things get created that COAF um, have a seat at those tables, just as we did for the BRC. Um, so to the extent that uh, we need to say that out loud, um, I'm saying it out loud. <laughs> That, that co-op wants some seats at that table. And Yemi's, Yemi's got her hand up too. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna, you know, sort of say one other thing. If this goes forward and, you know, that all remains to be seen. Um, but um, I think there should be a real um, focus and attention on pra practitioner, practitioner education and public education yes. around this. Um, because I just, I wouldn't want this to be confusing for folks. And I think naturally it's gonna raise a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. And to be as far ahead of that as possible um, in the planning um, is important. Maybe even in some of how the materials are presented to the court. That's you know you can you can you can set the 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 um, uh, uh, pilot up or the proposal up for success um, by going through those steps um, even at the outset. Um, just that's the marketer in me. Um, <laughs> I have my own feelings uh, on it, but. <laughs> The marketer me is happy to share that advice. Yes, I'm in total, I'm in total agreement. <laughs> I think the public education campaign um, is going to be a critical piece of it and making sure folks understand what it is and what it isn't. Um, and um, really helping to set the candidates up for success um, in their future legal career. Thank you, Donna. Thank uh, you. 
I think they you off the hook now. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna leave you. Um I have enjoyed uh getting to spend some time with you this morning. Yeah. Likewise. Thanks, Donna. Good to see Bye you. Now. All right. Um moving on to our next agenda item. There's Lisa. Hi Lisa. Lisa is going to um give us an update. Uh Thanks. Lisa. There you are, Lisa. Good. Hi. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Hi, everyone. My name is Lisa Chavez, and I'm the director of the Office of Research and Statistics at the State Bar. And I am pleased to share that this morning, the State Bar released the first ever comprehensive report on California law schools. Um, uh, this report examines the three types of law schools that are currently in California. Those are accredited by the ABA, those are accredited by the state bar, and those that are unaccredited but are registered that are registered and monitored by the state bar. Uh, the report leverages all sorts of great data and ultimately analyzes enrollment, attrition, and bar exam outcomes by race ethnicity, by gender identity across these three different types of schools. And the report also contains the results of a survey that the State Bar administered to law schools, asking them about their recruitment retention strategies, especially re with regards to diverse students. And I want to thank uh, some mem members of co-op. There was a small committee that was formed that gave us some feedback on the report, so much appreciated there. Um, I'm going to hand things back to Elizabeth to share with uh, plans for uh, how we can uh, have a more thorough presentation on this report and a discussion at a forthcoming meeting for you all. Yes. So looking forward that's to that. Exactly. Thank you so much, Lisa. That's exactly what I was just going to share. Um, because it was just published this morning, we obviously could not put together a presentation, invite our colleagues from the Office of Admissions to join us. So um, we uh, it's actually in our work plan to to do that um, probably in our first meeting of 2024. Uh, we'll invite Lisa back um, as well as somebody from the Office of Admissions to um, kind of go over the key findings from the report and then talk about um, admissions plans, um, you know, based on the report for future initiatives. So I think um, that will be a very uh, robust discussion, I'm sure. Yeah. And yes, I wanted to thank again um, members from COAF who reviewed a draft of the report. I believe that was Novella and Shalak. Um, and also prior co-op members who helped with um, some of the law school surveying and other activities uh, that because this this uh, profile report is many years in the making. So uh, very exciting to hear that it was published this morning. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you. Congratulations, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's, and Shalak and Novella, thank you for all the work you did on that as well. Can I just yes, <laughs> just very quickly, Lisa, sure. I want to commend you. You. Elizabeth, all of your team who worked so hard on this report, gathering focus groups and surveys and meetings and reviewing, and it's it's tr I I truly believe that for law schools, ABA accredited all the way through um, registered unaccredited to be held accountable, this type of report is exactly what we need, and I applaud you all and the State Bar for really taking that very seriously, and I'm looking forward to what the steps will be to help continue to transform legal education through the ways that the State Bar can do it. So thank you very, very much for your commitment to this. Yeah, yeah. and and, and I'm going to just second that because I know, Lisa, that I'm kind of a thorn in the side of on this issue, too, um, so I'm, I'm really grateful. Because uh, it has been like four years at least yeah. in the making. So congratulations on getting that out. Really, Thank it's you. tremendous work. And also it looks great on oh, the you're website. Already looking at oh, you've already seen it. Oh, <laughs> so I just pulled pull it up. It looks website. great. <laughs> Good. Like, 10 out of 10 marketing. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Lisa. Appreciate Thank you. that. Bye-bye okay. now. Okay. Um, Danielle, can you uh give us an update on the leadership seal i sure can uh i will share some slides if you give me just a moment to pull those up you um get to hear from me for the next two agenda items so 
<laughs> we will go awesome. ahead and get started. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Danielle McRae. I'm a lead program analyst in the Office of Access and Inclusion um, and on the staff team for our DEI Leadership SEAL program. Here to give you a quick update on what we've been doing the last few months and facilitate some discussion and brainstorming on um, opportunities for improvement, growth, um, and get your all's feedback on um, next steps and where we go next. So for the newer members of COAF, I wanted to give a high level overview of the program, what the DEI Leadership SEAL program is that we're talking about. Um, and if you have any additional questions, feel free to stop me um, on this slide or any slide as we go through. So the DEI Leadership SEAL program um, is a program that the State Bar launched in January of this year that recognizes legal employers, employers that um, have California attorneys on their staff who commit to and implement a list of DEI best practices in the workplace. So we created a list of 10 action items and employers can commit to implementing those or if they're a little further along on their DEI journey and have already implemented um, a number of those action items, they can be part of this program. Those action items include things like collecting data on employee demographics, creating a DEI strategic plan, comparing attorney hire demographics to the California attorney population as a whole, uh, creating and publicly sharing a DEI statement that they put on their website and their job postings. And so, as I mentioned, employers can either be a committed employer if they commit to implementing five or more of this list of action items, or if they've already implemented at least five, they can be um, rec recognized as a SEAL recipient. They actually get a little SEAL that they can use on their web and print materials. There's quite a small um, version of it. I'm sorry, it's not a little bigger. Um, in the corner, that's what the SEAL looks like. And those SEAL recipients receive either a bronze, silver, or gold SEAL, depending on the number of action items implemented. So um, to be in the program and to be a bronze SEAL recipient, bronze tier SEAL recipient, they need to implement at least five. Um, silver, they need to implement at least seven. And for gold, they need to implement at least nine of the 10 action items. And we just released, or excuse me, announced the first cohort of SEAL recipients and committed employers in June of this year. So we had, I believe, 43 um, SEAL recipients and 34 com um, committed or vice versa. I may be flipping those, but um, about 35 to 40 um, in each category, 77 total. And so what we've been doing since the last COAF meeting, um, reviewing and updating the five-year implementation plan, which is an internal document that um, identifies our goals for the program, steps for continuing to iterate, um, improve, and grow the program. And particularly, we've been revising that with um, the knowledge of lessons learned in the first year. And some of our goals that we set before we launched the program, we've been able um, to, to reset and even make a little bit more ambitious based on the success of the first cohort, which is super exciting. We've also been doing a lot of outreach, particularly to law school stakeholders presented um, to the law school assembly and other law school groups on this program with two goals. So one is that law schools can be uh, participating employers in this program, but we only received one application from a law school in the first cohort. So we wanted to put this in front of law schools to potentially increase their interest as potential participating employers. But we also wanted to increase interest among law students who could look to this list of participating employers when they're evaluating their employment opportunities. So for law students that DEI is a really important value for them, um, we want them to know that this program exists so they can go onto the State Bar website and see what employers have committed to these action items or have already implemented these action items when they're evaluating um, internship, externship, fellowship, job opportunities. We also, um, at the request of the Board of Trustees, are evaluating strategies to make this program cost neutral. Um, so we're looking at, at what that might look like and what our options are there. Also identifying and providing um, interim opportunities for committed employers and SEAL recipients to submit documentation before the implementation window closes. So for those that 
applied in January of this year were announced as um, committed um, employers in June of this year, they have one year or until June 2024 to implement the action items and become a SEAL recipient. But if they do it earlier and they want to get that SEAL earlier, we're offering some interim opportunities for them to do that. So we had one in August, we had one last month, and then we have another one scheduled in February, um, giving some of those folks who are already in the program an opportunity to move up, if you will. Uh, relatedly, we are gearing up for the application cycle, the next application cycle, which will start in January. So that looks like updating and creating some new application materials. And then finally, as I feel like I've mentioned um, in our last several co-op meetings, continuing to brainstorm opportunities to offer additional benefits to participating employers, conduct outreach, um, either in a more substantial way to folks that we've already touched base with or to reach into new areas um, and people that we can share this program with. So that's what we've been doing the last few months in this space. Um, but I would love to stop talking myself and see if you all have any thoughts um, on, on what I've presented so far, but then also I have a couple like asks or, or guide, um, discussion guide, guiding um, points, I guess. Would love if you have any particular um, ideas on additional benefits to offer to participating employers, uh, opportunities to conduct greater outreach, like I said, and then also something we're looking towards in the next year or so um, is modifying the action items or creating new action items to make the program um, to, to ask more of employers that are in the program. That's always been one of the program goals that um, we wanna ask more of folks. It's not that you've, you've checked off you know, your five things and you're done forever. Um, so every few years that list is gonna change a little bit. And so if you all have any feedback on how that list might um, maybe should change, happy to have that discussion too. And for reference on the next slide, there's a list of the current action items. Um, but yeah, I will stop talking at this point and take any questions, feedback, ideas. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, Tristan has a question. Um, ha have, has the State Bar in this format specified the way that the uh, demographic data should be collected? Like, in other words, have we specified the category so that we can ensure it matches up with what the State Bar is normally collecting and the CJA and the C... I mean, there's all of this effort to consistently... Um, collect data. Are we requiring them to do that? That's a no. great question. Yeah. So right now we're not. Oh, sorry, Elizabeth, if you're trying to answer at the same time. In the resource guide and materials around that action item, we recommend that they use the same categories that the state bar collects data in, um, but acknowledging that for various political or legal reasons, some um, organizations can kind of collect data that others cannot. We didn't want to mandate the categories that folks collected. But can't they try to collect all the data? I mean, if no. there are some government employers that cannot collect all those, all of the categories. Really? Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, are there measures other than pure data for evaluating how these goals are being achieved or implemented? I think the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, it's not, uh, it's, uh, Danielle, why don't you go to the next slide? Yeah, of course. Um, so these are the action items. So a lot of them are data-based, but um, some of them include like the questions on your stay and exit interviews um, and encouraging employers to begin conducting them. Um, you know, if, uh, if, if in getting, you know, staff um, feedback, you know, through surveying, as well okay. um so it's not just Great. yeah and that then was, that was my yeah question. and then like it's the constituents were yes yeah. <laughs> yes exactly and then you know requiring trainings um we, we we say implicit bias trainings but i know there are a lot of employers who are going above and beyond that um to not just do impl an implicit bias training but to have other other dei related trainings like allyship and and other other i think really important work there and then um uh, in, in a, incorporating DEI work into performance evaluations and compensation decisions, I think, think was a really important one, as well as the last one related to um, uh, in integrating the DEI responsibilities into the leadership team. So it's not just, um, you know, uh, one person necessarily, and that there is like responsibility from the top down. Wonderful. 
And those survey results, they have to turn over? They do not turn over the survey results to the state bar. Right now, we are just asking them to tell us what questions they're asking. Okay. And do we provide a list of recommended questions? We do have a resource guide that Danielle referenced where we have linked to um, resources that we've reviewed that are available publicly um, that we thought could be a good start for folks. But we are, uh, and it's, I believe it's in our five year plan, Danielle, to, you know, take a look at that resource guide moving, uh, you know, as we move forward to add and subtract things as we see fit. Because, I mean, there's a big difference between, you know, do you think that this is a good work environment and, you know, very drilling down into, mm -hmm. do you see your peers advancing faster than you? You know, I mean, there's a whole, there's a lot of ways to manipulate that data. Um, I, I mean, I would hate to see that employers who are getting bad results on their surveys and who aren't asking the right questions are actually getting to seal mm -hmm. because they we could actually be helping to cover their malfeasance for, mm -hmm. for lack of a better word by giving you know they're giving lip service and if we're not drilling down we've now done something worse than doing nothing mm -hmm. because we've actually given them literally a stamp of approval and it's going to be used in lawsuits 100 percent, i can tell you this will be used as a i mean these are the kinds of things i'm advising my clients on and you know, it's best practice, right? And if this is available and they're busy discriminating left and right, now they think, oh, well, I've got this nice seal and I don't have to do anything else. So that gives me great concern. Thank you. Uh, Michael, you had your hand briefly. Sure, just and I, to provide a little more context, I know that Danielle and a lot of other staff have spent a lot of time reviewing the submissions. Mm -hmm. So it's not just that folks are submitting an application that says we've created a, a DEI plan. They're submitting the DEI plan and there's feedback coming back from the state bar in terms of your DEI plan that says we are going to be a diverse, equitable and inclusive <laughs> place is not a strategic plan. Like that's, so there is some layer of review beyond just somebody certifying that they are doing these things. Yes, that's correct. And I appreciate all of the work that you've done, Danielle, and that the rest of the folks have done in moving this forward. Thank you. Yeah, and just to add an, another layer to that, in that review, you know, I'll be honest in that we've also had to weigh or balance that with, like, are we as the state bar the best person to make a judgment call on if something is a good DEI statement or, um, you know, a a successful implicit bias training and so that is a balance that we've um been trying to find throughout building um and imp implementing this program but yes there is um a pretty thorough review and documentation required when an organization says that they've implemented any one of these action items um there's there's some paperwork involved at a minimum um and i also want to just raise that tara also has her hand raised um yeah. Yeah, yeah we can Thank, thanks, Danielle. We get we can see her. I was gonna call Perfect. her next. Perfect. Tara and then Shalak. I have a question. Thank you for this. This is I think it's fantastic that you're doing this. I remember when I was in Texas and I saw this and I thought <laughs> that it was great. Um, I have a question about the incorporating DEI work into performance advancement and compensation decisions. Are we receiving any pushback from employers after the recent affirmative action decision that was made over the summer? Not in, Elizabeth may know more on this than I do, not necessarily in the context of the DEI Leadership Seal program. That's something that um, I think our stakeholders are talking about more broadly, um, but we have not received any pushback on that specific action item yet. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's it's going to be a good segue. Yeah, next agenda item. That's going to be a good segue to our next topic. Does anybody else? I, oh, oh, yeah. I'm sorry, Shalak. I totally forgot. Yeah, I, I should have diversity on my team. So, yeah. I just want to say, sort of speaking to Tristan's concern, that that might be ideas for future action items, right? Mm -hmm. So, being able to take some of those concerns and drill down. Okay, great. You created a strategic DEI plan. Mm -hmm. Like next step action item is how your yes. evaluation is. You ask these, you know, survey questions. Next step is have you done a climate report? And then what are yeah. how are you updating your strategic plan based on your survey? So, you know, as you're thinking about like, okay, how do we continue to expand the action items so someone whose gold isn't sort of resting on their laurels and hiding behind the state bar? 
those things that create those next levels going from like a 101 to a 201 to a yeah. 501 right like i think can be really helpful um and will help people to see that in the same way i tell my students there's always more work to be done so great i did this thing well we're not just stopping so maybe your dei plan right now focuses on certain demographics have you thought through what it looks like then to think about other demographics or the inclusion experience or everyone's favorite word now belonging and so on and so forth so <laughs> yeah. should it be snarky it's in my title <laughs> yeah, i was gonna say is it your title yes and belonging <laughs> nonetheless um but i think thinking about those things creates opportunities for further action items and the yep. state bar's ability to help people think about how they can move beyond the surface mm -hmm. um, to a more just profession. And that is the goal of um, looking at the action items and modifying them. You know, we understand that, um, you know, diversity and inclusion is a journey. It's mm -hmm. not a destination. And we want to um, encourage continuous improvement and growth. And so, um, yeah, so that's why some of these, you know, we've gotten feedback um, from various stakeholders that that's too simple. Why, why are we, that's it. And, um, yeah. but the, you know, recognizing that employers in the state of California, that employee attorneys are on a spectrum mm -hmm. and we want it, we didn't want, um, the program to be a barrier. We want it to be encouraging. Um, and so, uh, with the review process, it is very, uh, collaborative. It's not just you submit your materials it's, and it's yay or nay. We really do work very closely with all of the applicants to make sure we understand what, you know, how they're collecting their demographic information and, and uh, what they do with it and, you know, how they created the strategic plan and that sort of thing. So it's, um, it is, uh, it, yeah, it's not just submitting, certifying that they did it and we giving them uh, a seal. Cool. Okay. Uh, okay. Y yummy and then Tristan. <laughs> uh, yeah, quickly to that point, I, I just think that the program is, um, is um, you know, framed as leadership. Because I think it allows the um, program to evolve because of what it means to lead today, what it means for that gold. Um, I just wrote to a friend of mine who I think is responsible for her firm being on the gold list. And I want to know more about that. Um, I'm excited <laughs> about that. But, um, you know, what it means to lead the first year you're, you know, have a gold, silver, bronze star, maybe something different in year three, four or yeah. five. And then, um, yeah, so I just, I think leadership evolves. And so I like that title and the questions will mature. And I um, really appreciate the work around this and uh, look forward to more of it. Thank you. Thanks, Yemi. Uh, Tristan. Yeah. So um, first of all, I'd love to be involved in this review. That was um, great. Yeah. Good. Because um, I was about to take volunteers in a minute. So yeah, yeah and, exactly. That was the next question. Right. <laughs> and, and Danielle, I want I mean, I please don't think that I don't support the idea. I, I don't want to be disrespectful in any way, um, sort of finding my footing, right? So I also appreciate all of the work. And I do want to encourage you, you know, you said you don't know if it's the state bar's role to determine proper DEI efforts. And I think it very much is our role. I mean, in our mission, it says support efforts for greater access to and inclusion in the legal system. And I think this clearly is us being hopefully a leader in that space. And so my concern around it would be um, we'd want to have consistency. It needs to be very, very consistent, right? The way, because, you know, we could also injure a firm if we, you know, we mistakenly think what they're doing is not enough, for example, right? And this is going to look a little different for a firm in Yuma than it is a firm in LA, right? I mean, the and so I would love to know what kinds of education and guidance is being given to you, you and the team um, and how comfortable you feel with these decisions, right? Because these things do evolve pretty consistently. And the stuff I was teaching people two years ago is not the same stuff I'm teaching them now. And so I'm, I'm just curious if, if it's possible, you know, do we have some conformity guidelines and do we have education that's happening for our team members that are looking at this? We do use a rubric, okay. a scoring rubric that's based, um, well, uh, as I think most everybody knows, uh, in the Office of Access and Inclusion, mm -hmm. we also do grant making. And for our discretionary grants, we use a rubric to store applications. And so we developed a rubric similarly. Um, and so uh, in developing these criteria, as well as um, the resource guide, we've worked with um, various like legal aid leaders uh, in, in the field to get feedback to help us develop these tools. Um, uh, so, and, you know, uh, we're always open to, you know, more 
feedback and um, information from whoever wants to give it to us. It sounds like Tristan wants to. <laughs> no, she's already volunteered, she, yeah. so I already so, wrote her name down. Good. And I already feel yeah. proud on my little spreadsheet. <laughs> 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 so it's legitimate. So it's real time. Yeah. It's real time. Yeah. 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 Real time. Yeah. Not yeah. So we're, uh, we're, I, I think we're happy to yeah. you know continue the conversation um, moving forward, for sure. Excellent. And, and as we go forward, I, I should have said this to to new folks, but um, and I, and I will call it out when I know that we we need folks. Um, but you know, all of all the things you're hearing about have uh, working groups with COAF members attached to them. So um, as you're going through today's agenda, if there's something that speaks to you that you want to be a part of, uh, don't be afraid. Yeah. yeah okay. And Yami's got her hand up too. Good. <laughs> don't be afraid. I have you marked down for some other things coming up too, so oh, okay. don't don't go far. Uh, <laughs> the danger is that you want to volunteer for. Yeah, remember what Michael? Uh, I don't know if you were all here when Michael said at the beginning uh, that every time he comes back from a from a meeting with me, he's on two other things that he wasn't <laughs> before. Um, so some of you who know me well know that's true. So <laughs> um, so yeah, please jump in um, as we move forward. Uh, okay, other questions on this before we move on? Thank you, uh, Danielle uh, and Elizabeth, for all your work on this. Um, I know I said this last time, but this is a co-op idea. It was part of our work plan a couple of years ago. Uh, it was, oh, it was Elizabeth's <laughs> idea. Sorry. And not everybody on co-op agreed. It was Elizabeth's <laughs> idea that she brought to co-op. Not everyone on co-op loved it. Enough people on co-op loved it that we moved it forward. Um, and it's now out there and people are now getting the seals and using the seals. So um, I know I say I said this before, but um, the work we do here matters uh, deeply and we have the ability to impact um, the profession uh, in, in big ways. So I'm so grateful that you all are here um, to continue doing that work with us. Uh, and then we are going to move on. Danielle, you're going to talk about. Oh, there you are. Okay. What? The diversity summit. Oh, and the diversity summit. Yay! Look, we're right up here already. Diversity yeah. summit. Um, same power. We're just um, put it in the same PowerPoint. Oh, excellent. Good thinking. <laughs> Great. Um, wonderful. Yeah. So this. Um, I'm sorry. Was there any yeah. questions? In the no, go ahead, Danielle. Okay, great. Um, like wonderful. Beef. Yeah, so this portion will be um, much more brief, I believe. Um, but just wanted to let you all know that we have officially scheduled the this year's diversity summit. It is next Thursday. Uh, yes, it register will, if you haven't registered. Yeah. <laughs> Next Thursday from 10 a.m. to noon via Zoom. Um, I believe you all should have gotten the invitation um, via email, but if you did not, please let me and Elizabeth know and we will get that to you ASAP. Um, we have this beautiful save the date that one of our colleagues, um, Mikey Chong, put together for us. And uh, yeah, so just wanted to let you know that this is happening and it's happening very soon. And what we plan to cover during this diversity summit is we will have a keynote ad uh, address from Professor Rachel Moran of UCL UCI Law, excuse me, on the um, Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard case and what that means um, for employers, followed by a Q&A session with her on the intricacies of the case and the case law um, and where we go next. That will be followed up by a panel on uh, championing, championing, I'm having a hard time saying that this week, right. DEI um, in the workplace. So this is a panel um, of some DEI leaders and uh, stakeholders that have um, been uh, great partners in a lot of conversations with the state bar on a DEI. And this panel will be focused around increasing support for advancing DEI among both organization leadership and employees um, really in the current climate and context. And that panel will include um, folks from city's attorney's office, the Children's Law Center of California, um, Davis Wright Tremaine, which is a, a firm. And then our lovely Shalak will be moderating this panel for us. So thank you Shalak for offering to do that. Um, yeah, so it's a packed agenda. We're excited and um, feel like we'll be covering a lot. Cycle <laughs> Great, thank you for that. Uh, I see Pam, you have your hand up. I, I think it's on. I, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. I don't recall receiving the invitation for this. And oh, no. Have it. 
seems like a gap, so I may have missed it. But if Me you could too. send Sure. It. So we'll resend that. Is it just Thank Pam you. and Desrel? Okay. Desrel did oh, I don't have it either. Oh, my goodness. Okay. <laughs> well, oh, fine. Oh. Maybe we used to know one. I got it. I do. <laughs> well, it also came through. Um, Novella didn't, uh, though. It came through uh, not like my email address or Danielle's email address. It came through a. It Worcester. came with Lee. I thought it came with Leah's name and on it. And it came with Leah's name. It came with Leah's name on it. Yeah. So, um, so okay. Anyway. So we'll resend it to all of COAF. Yeah. Um, including our liaisons. Um, uh, yes. Yes. Will this okay. be recorded for folks that can't make it? No. That's too bad. <laughs> yeah. To to encourage you know frank and honest conversation, we will not be recording it. I appreciate that. Sorry. Yeah, and thank you, Shalak, for um, agreeing to moderate. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any other questions about the uh, diversity summit? Please register. Uh, okay. Um, we are moving on to uh, our outreach materials. Yummy. I yes. got your, I got you in my thoughts here on, <laughs> on our outreach and marketing materials. <laughs> this, this is just be a very quick update. Um, I know we had a discussion on this last time about the video. Um, outreach series that we had worked on, um, driven you know m mostly by Heather and Brian, who are no longer on COAF, um, and talking about different ways to um, further develop this campaign. Um, so I uh, I would like Kristen currently is our uh, sole working group member, so it, I would like to ask for one or possibly two um, COAF members to join the working group, so we can kind of discuss more and um, come up with perhaps a plan um, that we can report back to at a future cloth meeting. Look at you. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Happy, happy. <laughs> Look at you. Uh, anybody else? Well. I'm sorry? I'm happy to volunteer as well. Oh, is that you, Tara? Great. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Okay. Um, awesome. Um, yeah. Is that all you had? Yeah, that's that? all I okay. have on that. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and then we are going to move on to um, an update on the research on innovation our innovative DEI practices, which I think is Shalak going to do that? I am. Wow. And Lauren's here yes. too. Uh, Hi, Lauren. Yes. Hello, uh, members Woo. of COAF. Um, I presented uh, on August 25th, but also just wanted to reintroduce myself. I'm Lauren McGarry. I'm a senior program analyst in the State Bar's Office of Access and Inclusion, and I'm also uh, one of the staff members supporting the Working Group on Innovative DEI Research Practices. Um, and so today, uh, Shalak has volunteered to give a brief summary on our first Working Group meeting. Um, and I have, uh, 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 we have a few slides to share with you all. Um, so I'm going to share my screen with the slides and then hand it over to Shalak. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so this working group was formed after the August 25th meeting. It consists of myself, Tristan, which has been so fun to get to know you, and Lauren as a staff member. And so, so far, we've had one meeting, one working group meeting uh, around this. And the purpose of that meeting was really to start by discussing what the the ways that the DEI practice research presented at the August 25th meeting and additional ideas, which are really key to the state bar strategic plan. And we just want to highlight that, that the idea here is that being innovative and thinking about steps moving forward are key to increasing access, improving access to legal advice and services, and ultimately having a legal profession that reflects the diversity of the communities, as we've already noted in discussion on other topics, these things don't remain stagnant. And so I think that's why we're excited about this group. And so part of what we're looking at here is also the ways that other practices from other industries may be adaptable to us and we can learn from other people. So this working group aims to accomplish several things, um, identifying ideas that the state bar should consider implementing both from the August 25th meeting and from any additional ideas that are brought out of the group, identifying the steps that are necessary in that process to move forward, and helping to think about how we articulate the relationship between the state bar's commitment to DEI and whatever practices come out. So, sorry, Lauren, I moved 
forward. I, I didn't move oh, quickly no, enough. No, you're absolutely um, fine. Okay. <laughs> absolutely fine. So, um, so we can move forward and um, yeah. here are the, yes. Perfect. So we discussed several ideas in the meeting and I'll just briefly go over them. The first is taking a position and offering guidance on the Supreme Court's most recent ruling on college admissions. So we discussed students for fair admissions versus Harvard unit UNC and whether or not there should be there could be any type of creation of a guidance for the state for the state bar to share on how the ruling may impact DEI policies and practices, particularly of California legal employers and law schools. Um, as noted, the summit may address some of this, but it was the question of whether or not the the state bar should generate not necessarily a response to the ruling, but a resource guide on how this may apply. The staff would need to explore feasibility for that, including impact on partners and whether or not the state bar can take a position on that as well. Uh, the next was promoting inclusive practices in the court system. And so we discussed ways that the state bar could support the court system and engaging in more inclusive practices and supporting those like our a liaison, Judge Delphin, for example. An example given was whether court documents can start adding pronouns to ensure that appropriate pronouns are used to refer to individuals in court, or whether the court may have stricter or more specific guidance on name pronunciation to diminish the extent to which individuals' names are mispronounced. And so we noted that implementing these ideas would fall under the purview of the Judicial Council, not necessarily COAF. But what does it look like to be able mm -hmm. to support the Judicial Council if they wanted to move forward with that type of thing? We discussed developing a new curriculum that would be able to assist legal employers with implementation of DEI practices and really thought about the leadership seal in that. And so the curriculum that could include teachings on critical issues such as racism and sexism, provide basic guidance on policies and practices that employers could have in place, and again, in that conversation could provide as well a starting point for organizations that want to learn about ways to advance DEI, but may not be in the position to commit to the DEI leadership seal yet. So kind of an on-ramp to those who may be interested in getting there and might include different course levels appropriate for people at various ports of their organization. We also discussed amplifying efforts to encourage first generation students and those from other underrepresented communities to go to law school. So we discussed concerns that we have around law school admission and attrition, the potential impact, of course, again, of that Supreme Court decision, but also just generally the increasing cost of law school attendance and so on. Um, and so thought about what it looked like for the state bar to continue to use its influence to encourage more interest in pursuing a law degree, segue to join the video. For <laughs> In addition to this, we also talked about ideas that had been presented to COAF in August. And so those included acknowledging what has worked and what has not worked and being able to help uh, employers and practitioners and lawyers in general think about what it would look like to be able to assess um, what hasn't worked and help people figure out why. And so we talked about the state bar hosting a focus group in which partic participants feel safe to share practices that they've tried but have not necessarily led to positive results, and then helping to identify best practices that might work well in one setting or for one employer but would not necessarily be applicable to the point of someone can do something in a more rural area that might work really, really well but wouldn't apply in LA County and vice versa. Um, we also discussed it, uh, whether or not a creation of a list of don'ts might function well, as well as a best practices guide. We talked about formatting the diversity report card to emphasize metrics that show where there are improvements to DEI and where measures have stayed the same or diminished in the idea that this could promote greater transparency and that by reflecting those metrics accurately and doing comparisons, people can draw their own conclusions about the state of DEI. But we noted in the working group, and Lauren was really helpful with this, um, that we may not be able to do that comparison year to year rather than over a set of years. So we may see greater results and difference in the ability to draw conclusions for something between 2020 and 2025 
than 2020 and 2021. Sure. Finally, um, this was a great meeting, by the way. <laughs> but, it sounds like a great meeting. I'm sad I wasn't there. <laughs> finally, we discussed identifying and sharing individual examples of legal employers promoting DEI in their workplaces. And so the idea here was to partner with communications and marketing to think about what it looked like to publish like an employer spotlight once a quarter that could be succinct, that could be the employer's response to a standard short set of questions that communications or others may develop that could create a profile, but that we feel could be inspirational to people and could be small or large wins. And so our next steps are to meet again, to continue discussing the feasibility of some of these, narrow down some ideas and talk through timelines. Um, so we welcome any discussion that you all may have. And we did discuss that the seal yeah, <laughs> perfect. You can, over, you can exactly. overhear my, my question. Couldn't we just yeah. attach this? Yes, to the seal? that yeah, was part of it. Right? Good cross pollination, right? right? To mm -hmm. encourage right. people to do this. It's a good marketing tool. That's exactly what we talked about. Yeah, I mean, do you hear that? I'm using the marketing part. <laughs> yeah. Every time I say marketing, I'm going to look at you. Yeah, yeah that, um, that was part of it. No, yeah. and that was a thread throughout our conversation was the ways that innovative practices could build on things the state bar is already doing right. rather than just creating additional work like making it meaningful additional work and right. um yeah that the easiest pool to start from for the spotlights are the leadership seal recipients and this might be a good perk to the gold level right you get a spotlight right. you get right. a spotlight yeah no i mean this sounds like it was a great meeting those are um i mean those are and it's, it's an amazing list of of ideas. I don't, it's a very exciting list of ideas. <laughs> Elizabeth's yeah. gonna say we can't do them all. No, and well, um, she's, she's the cooler in the in the. Casino. <laughs> Remember, yes. the leadership seal was her idea. No, um, and um, I I just want to not I don't want to um, stifle engagement in this discussion. However, I do want to just point out that we still need to explore feasibility yeah. oh, um, in terms of like staffing resources. A lot of some of these things are, are actually not, you know, uh, it, controlled by, you know, mm -hmm. state bar staff. Mm -hmm. There are other stakeholders we need to involve and get their input on sure. and that sort of thing. And so, um, you know, we, yeah, this is just the beginning of a, a process. Yeah. So Absolutely. And I think on that. Our, um, our working group really started to think about that and the ways that in some of these things, it's not necessarily a state bar doing the work, but being supportive right. and but, influential but, and offering a co-op member or whatever sure. who may be able to help mm -hmm. another group that might, this may be their purview, to think about being innovative themselves and where we can come along line. So yes, our next phase is feasibility, timelines, um, whom of our liaisons or others it might be worth having meetings with yeah. and exploring with them what some of these things might look like. Yeah, those are phenomenal. Again, I said I wasn't at this meeting because it sounds like it was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, and a lot of brilliant ideas came out and hopefully uh, it, uh, Judge Dolce heard uh, the part about the, about the judicial council forms. That's, yes. I mean, that's a, a, you know, a great idea. And so, you know, maybe well, there are ways to. Can I elaborate on that? Yeah. Just a little? So um, this came out of, you know, sort of a personal campaign that I have in San Diego of trying to get some of our local courts to adopt um, providing a space for pronouns on all of the forms that they have that are local, not necessarily the statewide forms. Right. And we have some very particular complaints in San Diego of judges mispronouncing names, particularly um, AAPI names, and it feeling like it's intentional, right? And so, um, which is obviously incredibly dis disrespectful and may not be happening intentionally, but let's find a way to, to solve it. And so um, for me, it's kind of like, now I have the big, the army behind me, right? You know, like you're standing there, you're trying to fight a battle and yeah. people aren't really listening to you. And then the big army shows up and they're like, oh, maybe we should pay attention. And so um, I just love the idea that we might be able to make a suggestion to the JC or to the CJA and provide a little bit of you know input, but then it's obviously not yeah. for us to say anything about how the courts run. But I do know that there's a lot of judges that I have talked to who say to me, Tristan, I wanna get it right. Um, I, I don't have the right data. You know, do I just put a post-it? I have to say, yes, just put a post-it you know, on your screen for now. She, her, you know, they, them, she, they. And 
I think if we can arm the, the sorry to use two military examples, but if we can equip the judges with a little more information to help them be successful, I think it helps to increase access and fairness. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, and you know, I, I, I don't know if you know this, but, you know, the judges in, in L.A. Superior Court have permission now to put their pronouns on their nameplates. Um, and so some have done that on both on their business cards and on their nameplates. Awesome. Um, and so, um, you know, just being able to 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 talk about those issues and keep them out in the front. And that's why it's so great that we have all of our liaisons, you know, with us at our meetings, because when these things come up, uh, we have folks that we can say, hey, let's talk, let's talk about that at some point when you have a minute. And judge, that's and the judge has her hand up. <laughs> yes. I, I, and I think you've got it right. It's not only maybe changing those forms, but it's education. And um, I do think uh, Judicial Council is working on that. And um, there's so many things you have to remember as a judge that I, you know, the post-it note is great. I can't tell you how many post-it notes I have up on my bench. <laughs> and they change, you know, from case to case. So it is twofold. Um, and of course, we'll work with you all um, to make sure those efforts go forward. Thank you. I appreciate that. Michael. Yes, Michael and then Yemi. There are so many committees that are in the Judges Association, the Judicial Council, the CJR, which is the California Judicial Education Research, Research. Center. Yeah. Might have got that wrong, but that focus specifically on that. So I'm involved in one of the education curriculum committees for diversity and access and inclusion. Um, and working with those groups is probably the best way to identify the issues and help formulate some of the working plans that may already be in place or that need to be refined. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, me? Um, you know, maybe some of this is maybe more appropriate for closed session, but in, in sort of thinking about and picking up a, um, something that, that I'm gleaning from Elizabeth's point, right? There's a little bit of a difference between um, identifying ladders of leadership, illuminating them, and actually being the liaison and the facilitator for that, for the individual person or group of people to um, uh, go through the process of attaining um, the, the um, uh, level of leadership or, or access. And so I just, I think there's a little bit of a difference in that. And as we do, more, as we take on more and more of the work of drilling down into what individual organizations are doing, I think it's important to come up and, and remember that separation um, so that we, um, yeah, I just think it's important to remember that separation no, I, either, that, but that won't be a closed session, but yeah. That's an excellent point. That's an excellent point. Thank you, Yemi, for bringing that up. Um, okay, anybody else um, have thoughts or questions for Shalak and Tristan and Lauren about um, the work that they've done so far? All right, seeing none, thank you, um, the three of you, for, um, for doing all this. I don't know when Lauren has time to do the other stuff that she and I are doing together. Too. I don't know what Elizabeth or Lauren sleep. I don't, or or Shannon or anybody else at the state bar, because uh, you're all doing so many things. But thank you um, for that report, and thank you, Shalak, for leading that. Thank you. Uh, Co-op members don't usually get to lead uh, discussion, so thank you for that. I, I feel like you, you do um, often. Uh, uh, really? Yeah, I definitely. I do, but that's oh, well, you, you, know, the, oh, you the, the, the the plural. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, well, it's nice when we get to do that. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to um, the update on the licensing resource page, which includes um, our imposter syndrome resources. And I'm looking to see if Alexa, Alexa, is, there. Alexa is here. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for allowing me to present today and provide this update. Bear with me a moment as I share my screen. Um, I did present at the last COAF meeting in August. Um, but just to reintroduce myself, my name is Alexa Montalvo, and I'm a program analyst in the State Bar. Um, I've been with the State Bar for about a year and have been helping support this initiative, um, or this working group, sorry, on imposter syndrome resources. Um, so as an update, um, or I guess for some, for some background, uh, the uh, State Bar decided to uh, or the working co-op working group decided to um, address imposter syndrome in the legal profession. And this arose out of the State Bar strategic plan to support retention, development, and advancement of a diverse legal profession with a focus on preventative measures to address disproportionate complaint and discipline rates. Um, we th then co-op created this working group um, 
which worked to create a toolkit comprised of various resources, such as articles, a worksheet, and video testimonials from attorneys across the legal profession um, to share their experience of combating imposter syndrome. And the goal of the toolkit is to have individuals across the legal profession from law students to practicing attorneys um, and employers now to um, have resources to prevent and combat imposter syndrome. Um, in the summer, uh, the state bar, state bar staff met with experts on imposter syndrome in the legal profession um, from Oregon. They were attorneys themselves across different sectors who um, provided a lot of resources and led a really great discussion on best practices for employers to help in preventing imposter syndrome as well as combating it, but with the goal being to prevent it before it even happens. Um, we took those resources that they had um, and applied it to our toolkit. So now that the toolkit has expanded to include resources for employers. Um, currently staff is working with the state bar communications team to pilot the video testimonials for the toolkit. And we're on track to have a video package for the webpage by mid January. Um, and staff is working with the Office of Professional Confidence to publish the toolkit to the state bar website. Um, and I wanna thank the working group. I wanna thank Sherlock and Stephanie for their work on this. and. Ryan Harrison, who um, has turned off the co-op, but their work and contributions to this project has helped really guide it to where, you know, to its, its final stages now. So, so thank you. And thank you to Elizabeth for the support as well. Yeah. Thanks, Alexa. Yeah, this uh, was a passion project for Ryan. So um, I'll make sure he knows how close we are to actually having a video. It's um, him. Yeah, well, good. It's him. Of course it's Ryan. <laughs> good. So he knows. He does. He knows it. about the video. He knows about the videos. So it's <laughs> good. Good. Um, all right. Questions for Alexa um, about the imposter syndrome resources in the toolkit. Being none. Thanks, Alexa. I appreciate uh, all the hard work you've kind of done on this, and the communications team. So thank you. Um, you know how I love a good type meeting. Mm -hmm. And we are right on time, my friend. All right. Uh, okay, Elizabeth's going to give us the uh, update on the implicit bias module. Love it when I'm on time. Um, so just a really quick update, because I know I stand between um, us and lunch. Um, yes. So um, we are currently working to engage with a subject matter expert um, to update the implicit bias um, online MCLE module that uh, COAP helped develop and we uh, released um, a couple of years ago, 2021, I believe. And um, uh, we're also working with our Office of Professional Competence, who um, at the State Bar uh, managed the new attorney mandatory 10-hour training, and there's also an implicit bias module in that. So we're coordinating with them so it's not the same training, and that the training, uh, the training that um, COAF um, helps support uh, is um, maybe like a 201, using um, Shalak's <laughs> reference earlier um, to the new attorney training, which might be a 101. Um, and so we're working on that and, and anticipate much of the work to uh, for updating our current module, which will just will will be a smaller update um, to get it into a different platform that's a little bit more user friendly. We've had some comments that um, that it's not a user friendly system that we have for the current <laughs> training so we want to do that and then also maybe um, refresh some of our um, examples and vignettes that we have in the training so um, i anticipate that that work will be done um, in 2024 and um, i know that erica carroll who uh, on staff couldn't be here today but uh, she's been working with angelica and novella um, uh, over over the summer to get some feedback um, and we'll probably reach back out um, as we begin more work on that uh, in earnest so that is the update yes I just wanted to add um, or share some information that at least at the ABA accredited schools that are in California, we're currently on the first class that has the requirement from the ABA to receive some type of anti-racism, anti-bias, cultural competencies. And so that's the class that graduates in 2025, six, six. Um, and so certainly by then, you know, hopefully that class and a couple of others, they may already have the 101 version is basically right. where I'm going. Yeah. So thinking about what that new mm -hmm. attorney section looks like, it may be helpful in the next couple of years to touch base with 
and hopefully the Cal accredited schools will have a similar type mm -hmm. requirement, right? So to touch base with the schools that are providing the licensees to see if there's any sort of common through line on some of the things that are being taught and shared under those accreditation requirements so that what the state bar does in the new licensee platform doesn't feel redundant mm -hmm. um, and is adding a new layer of you know what it might look like for them in practice because maybe the one that they received in school was more geared toward general or in school. Thank you. That's super helpful. I will definitely pass that along to our colleagues in professional competence. Thanks. Thank yeah. you, That is super helpful. The um, two of the three law schools in San Diego have been doing this training for mm -hmm. two years. I know because I've been doing it for them. So, <laughs> um, and it also includes civility is one of the pieces mm -hmm. that they're including. Yep. So um, I can certainly share some of that piece. information if yeah. you like. That would be great. That would be great. Yeah. Um, Novella or Angelica, do you have anything you wanted to add? Um, to to what um, Elizabeth already said about nope. this, <laughs> and Helica said no as well. Okay, Good. Uh, questions for or comments on this? Four minutes early. <laughs> Just gonna stretch because we're four minutes early on on this. Um, so. Um, it is uh, almost at the uh, noon hour, and so we're going to uh, take our um, scheduled lunch now um, and come back at, we're scheduled to come back at 1? Mm -hmm. Scheduled to come back at 1, so please everyone go and stretch um, and get something to eat, and then we will see you back uh, here at 1 to talk about our work plan and then hear from our liaisons. All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Come back after lunch. <laughs> uh, thank you for all coming back. Um, we are going to plow through our uh, afternoon agenda. I see from the agenda that I will be leading a discussion on DEI initiatives, uh, if any. Uh, I feel like um, it's hard to do the additional DEI initiatives when we haven't done the work plan. Is it possible? Can we switch? Slightly, and then and talk about the yeah. the work plan, and then have a discussion about additional DEI initiatives, because then everyone has a sense of what's on our work plan. Sure. I probably should have said this to you when we met before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> She's like, I'm just yeah. kidding. I'm just She's kidding. like, yeah, you should have said that before <laughs> when we met. But yes, okay. I'm just. Um... Oh, look, you're on the camera now. Yeah, I'm just joining so I can share my screen. Okay, so we are moving on to 6.11, which yes. is the 2024 work plan. 610 to review 2023, or are we, because that has the 23 work plan attached. Do you Correct. Understand? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen, and it's a Word version of the 2023 plan, and I've already taken the liberty to use track <laughs> changes on some of the items, um, and then we can, we'll can we walk through the items um, to, and discuss uh, what we might want to um, add or subtract. And we'll close this down. Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. It's a little far for me. Yeah, let me see if I can make that a little bigger. Yeah, too. that'd be good. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, so like I said, this is the 2023 plan, and I'm using track changes so we can see what um, changes for 2024. Um, um, do we? Is it going to be a problem that Leah's not here for this? She, I pinned <laughs> her, so she should be joining okay. any moment. Now. All right. I, I am here. Oh, great! Oh, hi, Leah. Hi. Welcome. Hi, Leah. Hi. <laughs> see, I was looking out for you. Uh, thank you. Thanks for joining <laughs> me. Okay. Okay. So. Um, um, so this is, <laughs> excuse me, as many of you know, this is the COAF charge. Um, I think it was uh, it was developed um, in about 2019, um, and I think it is pretty encompassing of what COAF um, is currently doing, so I don't have any recommended changes to it. Um, so then, um, sorry. So then, um, so our, our work plan is organized by State Bar Strategic Plan Goal, strategy and then implementation step. Uh, for those of you that are 
uh, have seen uh, have seen those state bar strategic plan. That's how the plan is organized. Um, and so um, all of cost activities are tied directly back to the strat plan. Um, and um, uh, it, on the screen is also like a deadline and whether we need to report up to the bar um, and if the, if we do um, the timing of that. Um, so you can see the first item is related to goal one, uh, re uh, strengthening the attorney discipline system, um, continuing to address racial and other disparities in the attorney discipline system. And um, the implementation step is related to uh, the 2019 report, discrepancies by race gender in the attorney discipline system by the state bar. And this is uh, informally called the Farkas report um, that I think um, most co-op members are, are very aware of and familiar with. Um, and so uh, the work plan activity for 2023 was to provide input and feedback on the state bar efforts to ensure an effective and fair attorney discipline system. And I'm proposing that we strike this because a lot of this work <laughs> was related to the ad hoc commission on attorney discipline. We would receive regular reports about their work in progress and their recommendations to the board. And that commission has now sunset. Um, and because this is such a broad work plan item, um, I'm suggesting we strike it um, because uh, further down, we have a more specific activity related to the attorney discipline system that I think COAF could become involved in. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and just so you all know, Michael and I already reviewed so, <laughs> this. So, um, so I don't know that you know that I will have a lot more to say but other than you know we agreed with the with the strikeout on this because you'll see later on um, that there's a something that we're doing on attorney discipline, and then uh, this was this was really about the Robertson and the Farkas reports. So Could we just skip to the one that you're both mentioning, sure. and then sure. come back. Um, so that item, and I'm sorry I'm scrolling and maybe giving people whiplash here. Um, okay, so here it is this item. Provide input on the follow-up study on of racial disparities in the attorney discipline system, including identifying areas for potential improvement and um, recommendations. Um, and so this work will be done in um, 2024. Um, the goal is to complete it in 2024. Uh, and my understanding um, in speaking with the staff working on that in the um, in our mission advancement office is that uh, we would probably be able to have um, a presentation on it in June to for to COAF um, and uh, receive feedback uh, and input from COAF at that time. And then um, before the uh, <coughs> study is published, I think there would be another opportunity. Okay. And, and yeah, and this would be like Farkas number two, I think. Informally, Fergus follow. Yeah, follow up Fergus stuff. Stuff. Right. Friend of Fergus. Friend of Fergus. Okay, that, that makes sense. Okay, then to strike those because that's more targeted on. Yeah, issues. yeah. It's just yeah. We we sort of did that. We sort of checked that box. Uh, can I ask though? Is the is it anticipate ask recommend whatever that the half that is what I'm Fergus squared um, <laughs> that. Is there going to be anything in there that focuses on solo and small firm practitioners? Just because I think in some of the uh, presentations that we had around mm -hmm. this, both with the racial and other disparities, but there was also disparity in solo practitioners and small firm practitioners receiving the support, receiving the follow up, as well as maybe, who knows, disproportionately being subject to um, discipline. Okay, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know, Leah. Uh, yeah, the answer is yes, so there will be. Okay, great. Particular great. focus. And I think in terms of this item being on COAS work plan, part of um, our hope or my hope is that you all can inform more on the front end of the sort of methodology development, how we might engage impacted communities and even designing the assessment itself. Like part of it is going to have to replicate Farkas 1 because we obviously want to see how we're doing, right? So it can't be an entirely different study. But I think there are a lot more opportunities for engagement up front in study design. And that's a place I hope to see COAP get engaged, involved. Thank you, Leah. Thanks, Leah. Great, thank you. Okay, so then the next item I'm suggesting that we strike is review court appointed counsel program data, including attorneys served and outcomes. Um, and uh, the reason for this is um, because uh, 
currently we have a very small program uh, related to court appointed counsel and it's specifically uh, for attorneys with mental health issues. Um, there, the Board of Trustees reviewed a proposal for income qualified attorneys um, to have a court appointed program, but we currently um, that uh, we don't have funding for that. It's unfunded, so we don't have a program. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, if and when that does happen, we can put this back onto the work plan. Was this the one that was supposed to be focused on? This was the the one that was focused on discipline, right? Correct. That that ba responding to the the report that you know mm -hmm. the more likely you are to have counsel. The, yes. You know, better if you have counsel, you do better essentially. Yes. Yeah. Not not shocking. Right. Information, but but important information. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, and because we don't currently have a program, there wouldn't any be any work on that for your call off. So um, there's nothing we, to review. That yeah. So we can <laughs> we can bring it back when if and when. Uh, there is a program to review. Mm -hmm. okay. Although, may I maybe make an asterisk? Is yes. there space for co-op to do any recommendations or review of the program that was proposed to exist? Well, we were the ones that proposed it. Yeah, right? like, is there, any, <laughs> is there anything on getting the program into it, existence? That co -op is it money, do? Leah? <laughs> it's money. It, it's money. Um, oh, we well, are then, slated no. to put, submit a report to the legislature in April outlining the sort of entirety of our um, uh, request for a fee increase, licensing fee increase for 2025. And I believe the board is going to include funding for this in that April report. I will say, since I spoke with Elizabeth about this work plan and something that I don't know if it it rises to the level of being on your work plan, but I definitely want to get it on your agenda because it's very interesting. Is that, you know, there are things that uh, we've been doing to try to encourage people to get counsel. One, sharing the findings of the um, Farkas uh, report and also just providing information in sort of OCTC communication with uh, respondents. And we've seen these steady increases for virtually all groups other than black male attorneys. And that was the population yeah. that was identified. That we were targeting. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So that is very interesting data oh. that I love to, you know, bring forward for discussion. Again, I'm not sure it's a, a work plan item, but I'm sorry, Alyssa, well, I didn't tell you this. I just, I think I just yeah. thought yesterday, but um it, it's it's interesting, and we're still looking at that. So absent a appointed counsel program, there are steps we've tried to take to increase um, people getting counsel, and it's been interesting to see the results of that. Yeah, I think that would be yeah worth listening. hearing about. I wonder if it might not be <clears throat> so just a complete strike through instead of review court appointed counsel program, mm -hmm. perhaps it's review state bar outreach on receiving or having counsel in the disciplinary system and then identify areas for improvements and make recommendations. So that is the opportunity with what Leah is discussing. What is the outreach that's been happening? What is the education that's going, you know, doing then having the opportunity in our work plan to dive a little bit deeper into what that data is and identify what are mechanisms that COAF might suggest other than court appointed counsel to support those education and outreach efforts. Yeah. I don't know if that's okay. I mean, that that's really troubling. <laughs> I think yeah, I think, that's I think that would, you know, personally, I think that would be fine. Yeah. Because it is a, con it's a question. Um, so. Oh, I'm, I'm yeah. sorry, Sherlock, you said something that was yes. perfectly oh, that proposed. happens so much. I did not and, type it. And then I'm thinking I'm gonna remember that is <laughs> that's the So I was saying instead of like completely striking through yes. change court appointed counsel program data to like state bar outreach and education data around having counsel, I guess, and then leave identify areas for improvements and make recommendations. Related to outside counsel. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Leah. I mean, it's troubling. I would leave. I'm sorry. I would leave including attorneys served in. Yes. And outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is that okay? 
Great. Is that right? There's a population of attorneys that are being served. And and just for folks who are for our new, you know, um, you know, brief synopsis and and maybe not not information that is shocking to anybody to hear, but um, you know, when when looking at the discipline rates, you know, black men were disciplined at a higher rate, uh, and they were also less likely to have counsel. And what we knew from the report also was that if you had counsel, you likely fared better. And so here was a way where we were trying to, you know, uh, encourage people to get counsel because getting counsel results in frequently a better outcome. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was where we sort of had put our efforts. And it sounds like we made progress in, in lots of groups, but not the group that we had really hoped would. So. Okay, great. Um, so um, is that the correct language? Sure, if I don't okay. remember what I said. Okay. Well, we recorded the meeting. So we can go back and, <laughs> we can go back and listen okay. to it. <laughs> so the next item is um, review data annually on violations of rule 8.4.1 and uh, based on review, make recommendations of potential interventions or actions by the board to the board. Michael. I think Michael has something to say well, on this. I asked this question last time <laughs> that George Cardona was here talking about 8.4.1, yes. which was the, is the now, I'll call it a related rule, 8.3, uh, that allows for attorneys to report each other to the state bar um, or to the courts. And I'd be interested in adding 8.3 as well to get any data as it comes in. It's still very new, but mm -hmm. to see if there are, are any gender, race, practice size uh, mm -hmm. disparities in any reporting there. Okay. I think one problem is we all think it's mandatory reporting, not that we can. Yeah. It, it, is, <laughs> it is mandatory. Well, okay. I mean, there are a lot, there are some really good education programs, I think, that are coming out right now, especially by local okay. bar associations on 8.3, but yeah, the rule as worded is shall report. Yeah. Um, and just a note, I know when um, George Cardona came um, to our last meeting, there was a follow-up question related to rule 8.4.1. He wasn't able to uh, obtain the data in time for today's meeting, but he will um, report back at a future co-op meeting. Awesome. Okay. Great. Um, so this is the item provide input on the uh, follow up study on racial disparities. So um, I think we're good here. <laughs> um, the next item is uh, now related to goal two: um, uh, enhance access to an inclusion in the legal system. Uh, and uh, re it's related to revising admissions requirements to be more relevant to the practice of law in alignment with the recommendations from the Blue Ribbon Commission on the future of the bar exam. Um, so this is provide input and feedback on the development of the, the new bar exam. Um, should, and as um, you know, Donna mentioned this morning, should the Supreme Court um, adopt that? Adopt, yes. Yeah, and that for folks who haven't read the entire Blue Ribbon, uh, one of the things that it does recommend is a California specific bar exam. So, so yeah, so there's that California specific bar exam and then the portfolio bar right. exam proposal, so, both of which are on the table. Right. And would we add the portfolio bar exams if here it, as well? Yeah. Or I think, at this um, point? yeah, that would make sense. Whatever it looks mm -hmm. like. Next item then is um, related to the diversity report card. Um, so continue to review attorney census data um, and then review data collected in my state bar profile and the attorney census survey. Um, there was a public comment at a meeting uh, of COAF earlier this year where a commenter uh, uh, draw, uh, brought to the attention of COAF that data related to tribal communities could be um, better refined and looked at. So um, it's on, well, if it's on this work plan, it must have been last year um, that the comment was made. And so um, 
Uh, Lisa Chavez, who we saw earlier, um, is also all her office also works on the attorney census, so she will be coming back in March to discuss uh, the census questions um, and and some other um, areas where we could look further into, uh, for example, categories or options that people can choose in um, self-identifying. Right. Um, yeah. So the only thing I changed here is the date. Um, so this next item um, is related to the guiding principles and examination development to minimize potential bias in the bar, in bar exam questions. Um, so a couple of years ago, members of COAF, along with the com committee on CBE, Committee on Bar Examinations, um, <laughs> were, uh, were uh, on a working group to look at um, bar exam questions. Uh, the state bar had engaged with a statistician to look at whether the questions um, had bias in them. And while there wasn't anything statistically significant um, that benefited one group over another, there were some um, questions that were flagged by the statistician. And so the board at the time asked um, members of COAF and CBE to look at those flagged questions. Um, and as a result, um, these guiding principles were developed. Um, and uh, once they were put into use, COAF recommended that our Office of Admissions uh, review um, whether the, if these guiding principles have had a, an impact on the questions. Um, and so I, I've talked uh, with my colleagues over in the Office of Admissions, and, and we will need to figure out um, the timing of when it would make sense to revisit um, a, a study of the questions um, and whether, you know, if introducing a, a new bar exam or a different modality for the bar exam um, has any bearing on that. So mm -hmm. we will do a little bit more research um, and circle back on that. Great. Um, so I think we will leave this here, but know that there may not be any action in 2024 while um, we figure out that, that question. We want to add something like, if appropriate, <laughs> recommend okay. so that it's not like we've missed something if we don't. Oh, I think it has oh, as appropriate. appropriate. Oh, does that apply to the entire sentence? I thought there oh, was a semicolon. Oh, there is. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Um, uh, so uh, this next set of items um, is related to um, supporting the law school to profession pipeline. Um, and it's uh, from time to time, COAF does invite <clears throat> researchers or other experts to make um, presentations uh, to the council on various issues. Um, so I think we can continue to leave that on the um, work plan. Um, and um, COAF can also continue to support presentations uh, to various groups along the pipeline. Um, and then the last item here is uh, discuss partnering with CLA on the one day pipeline summit. Um, and I know CLA has in the past uh, hosted this summit. Um, and so um, I know uh, I, I don't want to put Gladys on the spot or anything, but this is something we, we may want to discuss in the future. Yes. Might I recommend a, a small update to be discussed partnering with CLA or, and not to put Pam, if she's still in here on the spot, but mm -hmm. the Cal Law Pathways, like with both of those different liaisons, because Cal Pathways already has an annual summit every year, so or is that a summits separate? summits are different. Oh, okay. The summits are different and have different purposes. I know okay. the California Law Pathways Summit is uh, very targeted towards students and educators in that Partnership. Partnership mm -hmm. of the pipe and that pipeline work. Um, the, the summit that CLA has hosted is just related to getting kind of updates from the various stakeholders working on various pipeline uh, uh, projects. Okay. Um, so I think it's, um, yeah, it's just, it's a different audience. Okay. Can I, I don't know if there's some things somewhere else, but it might fit in this block, suggest something in the word plan about COAF. <laughs> And maybe it's just the presentations part and specifying there, but I think it might, it would be powerful. I mean, full disclosure, I'm on the Senate planning committee this year, so maybe that's why it's on my mind, but I think it would be powerful for the state bar to, you know, have be on a panel or presence or something 
at that annual summit is part of the outreach to growing mm -hmm. um, first generation and other historically underrepresented groups in the uh, profession. So I don't know if it has to be there or if that's just I don't think it has to be there specific, specifically. Yeah. Um, and I have had a conversation with not Pam, but one of her colleagues about that. So, OK. Yeah. Um, I just I, wanted I, to yeah. say that um, <laughs> one of our goals is definitely to collaborate with our um, partners and strengthen those partnerships um, and as much as possible um, kind of learn about the different K through undergrad and law school supports um, through the pipeline, like what everybody's doing um, and maybe not like duplicate efforts or whatnot, but definitely share, you know, resources and support. So yeah, I would love to join um, a meeting to discuss that further and support in any way possible. Right. Thank you, Gladys. Um, so this next item is related to the uh, video outreach series. I don't know if we want to change the language of it or if um, if you feel like it's sufficient. Um, um, and then this next one is um, related to, there is a state bar brochure called Be a Lawyer, Make a Difference. Um, about four years ago, COAF helped to update it, um, and it spotlights various uh, diverse attorneys um, in various parts of the state doing various types of work, um, including the Chief Justice. Um, we have since updated it to include the new Chief Justice. Um, uh, and so one of my questions for COAF is whether you would like to um, take a more uh, closer look at um, updating the brochure, um, or if you think we can just leave it as is for now and um, just continue to distribute and publicize it. I will just say as um, part of the working group that updated it four years ago, um, that uh, it, you know, it was Sal and I, and neither one of us are, mm -hmm. um, were, were experts in this uh, area. So I think it wouldn't hurt um, to have you know, the, the membership of COAF as it looks now um, with the, you know, experience that, that folks have now um, to, to take a look at it. So I would, I would leave it on there. Mm -hmm. um, there might be um, things that we would do different now, four years later. Uh, you know, when we, when we updated it, there was no pandemic. <laughs> so uh, it's a pre-pandemic document. So, um, you want to add something here? Review? Uh, I would just, mm -hmm. yeah, or yeah, review. review. Just put, okay. I don't think it has to be a new. Yeah, I don't think it needs to be a new item. Right. I'm just going to put a semicolon. Just put a semicolon, right. Mm -hmm. Yanni? Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, I just, I was just pulling it up now. When you say updated, do you mean add to it or stop well, or I, like five, I think five folks feature there's yeah i mean I, I haven't looked at it in a while uh you know it used to be an actual uh physical brochure until four years ago it wasn't online either um so you know i think it, it doesn't hurt to you know we updated it with the new chief justice but i don't think it hurts to you know um to look at who we have on there if we want to update that um if there's other things we want to talk about um or include mm -hmm. you know uh, there we have we have a there's a there's a different skill set now on COF than there was when Sal and I did this, um, and so you know I would your your brilliance um, and your you know and all of your uh, eye on it I think only makes it better. Okay. 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 Right now, but yeah. Cool. Okay. Great. Okay. So then the next set of activities is. Um, related to retention advancement in the profession um, and into the profession. And so the first one is participate in the law school assembly. Um, and so this is, uh, the law school assembly is um, a convening of various law school leaders. Uh, oftentimes they're deans and registrars and DEI folks. Um, uh, sometimes we've had co-op members come talk to them um, and uh, this this last year, we actually Danielle and I actually went and talked about the leadership seal. 
um, so we can continue to keep this on and, and um, participate uh, on various, as various uh, co-op-led initiatives come up. Um, and then I'm suggesting um, striking the next two items, and I'm sorry, there's a page break here. <laughs> um, so review demographic data related to CALS, CAL accredited law schools. Um, and then take the next one would be track law school attrition data from California ABA schools. I'm suggesting we strike those and instead have reviewed the, the just published profile of California law schools mm -hmm. um, and provide feedback and recommendations as appropriate. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Because that work actually led to the report. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> okay. Is now a good time to ask questions about what working groups would be Doing um, that, or is that for a later time? That's for a later time. Okay, sorry. <laughs> well, do you have thoughts? Well, I'm just so excited about to review the profile oh, okay. and to hear more about it. So once we hear about yeah. that, then we'll yeah. go into it. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, because I think we would want to hear from admissions kind of what their plans are before we... That makes sense. Yes. <laughs> Um, and then this, the next set, oops, is related to uh, the next set of action uh, activities is related to um, uh, uh, also recruitment and retention um, and engaging um, stakeholders. And so it's um, monitoring the leadership seal program, um, identifying and suggesting adjustments for action items and future iterations. Um, and I've just changed the date uh, to ongoing because I think that's uh, going to be iterative work. And then um, identifying and studying innovative DEI practices. That's the work that um, Shalak and Tristan are currently working on. Um, and so I think we'll um, continue to work on that this year and then plan and participate in diversity summits. Is that um, just summits put on by us or is that meant to be the various organizations throughout the state that do summits? Uh, it's the state bar. Okay, thank you. So the, the event of next week. Yeah, we don't have to change it. I'm just curious. Oh, OK. <laughs> Unless you want to. Well, I'll just to, for clarity. You, you were kind enough to ask me to be on one of your diversity summits. Yes, I was. So mindsets in legal education is an intervention um, that's available to uh, uh, bar exam takers, applicants. Mm -hmm. um, it's an intervention that um, is uh, targets uh, imposter syndrome and stereotype threat. Uh, we, the state bar, has been working with researchers um, to to um, to gauge its effectiveness, and COAF received. Um, presentations from the researchers um, probably uh, at least a year ago now yeah. uh, where the findings were very positive. Yeah. Uh, it increased uh, passage rates for um, first time takers and underrepresented takers um, uh, significantly. Wow. And so the state bar is continuing to um, have, uh, continuing with the intervention um, and is now self-funding it. Um, and so, um, when there's another juncture to review the data, um, the, uh, we can uh, work with the Office of Admissions to get a presentation on that. I didn't want to change it. I was going to ask if you had any sense or could ask for at any time where that could be, you know, because it was a year-ish ago. If they, I, I know they, they anticipate another. Um, mm -hmm. um, even if not, it's like a formal report, like an update, a conversation. Yeah, I know that there was a pause in the program because oh, okay. of um, some some issues related to the research. Mm -hmm. um, but I know, uh, I believe it was available for the last bar exam. Yeah, because be I remember available. pushing some of yeah. the students to it. Yeah, I feel like <laughs> I posted it on LinkedIn quite a few times. Is it open to any yeah, anybody access? who's that, that's what I was applying for the bar exam or uh, to take the bar exam um, will have has access to participate in it? Um, I think that you have to opt into it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. It's an opt in, like when you apply, register for the bar, you can opt into it. And then they'd send out like another email, maybe three to six weeks before, and you can opt in again and then participate. Mm -hmm. Is it like a, just a module that they go through or? It's, um, I believe it's like a 45 minute video series and then mm -hmm. some, some journaling prompts. Yeah. 
But the, I mean, the, the impact of, of it was significant. really significant. Like mm -hmm. if it's really 45 minutes, an hour of your time, like. And just, can be conducted remotely. Right. Mm -hmm. At any time, whenever you want. Like, That's right. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, then, uh, I will see when we can have another update, if there is another update to provide. Awesome. Okay. Um, and so this uh, next set of activities is related to bar exam proctors and graders um, and providing implicit bias trainings um, to them to reduce any potential bias. Um, and so uh, this was probably five years ago where uh, COAF uh, mm -hmm. made this recommendation to um, the Office of Admissions and they've since implemented um, uh, this requirement of implicit bias training. Um, and there was a uh, thought that COAF at one point wanted to monitor this, but we don't really know what that means to monitor because they're just continuing to do it. <laughs> um, and it's kind of- uh, And it's required, part of the right? Yeah, and it's part of the process now. So I'm suggesting that we strike it as completed. May I ask, is there a way to review? I'm truly asking, like, I don't know if there were any complaints or process or any other like, data where the state bar might review the impact of this training, maybe not so much for graders, but for proctors, like, because the training isn't, wasn't just like racial gender, right? Like I'm thinking about people who might have applied for received accommodations and other disability means or so on to review the impact of that training now that it's been happening for a couple of years on the actual bar taking mm -hmm. process yeah no one's going to be like yes i had a great time taking the bar those three days <laughs> right. right but that's different than i felt like my proctor was unfairly whatever yeah. when i went for my mm -hmm. accommodated and approved bathroom breaks right like there's right. a difference there so. i don't remember if this came out of a set of complaints or whether it was proactive one of those things where we were where we realized like when we were talking about the when we were talking about the experience of taking the bar exam um and and talking about who the graders were right because it used to be the the grading requirements used to be you had to be in like San Francisco right or in the the you had to be in, in the, the bay, bay area, area. Mm -hmm. like and so we this sort of came out of this idea of like who are these graders and um, and we're not getting, we're getting a very small subset of people. And then how are we training them and what are we training them on? And mm -hmm. I don't remember. I think you're correct. That if, if, if there was a specific complaint or whether it was just, this was COF's way of just saying like, wait a minute, we don't, yeah. Maybe. I don't, I don't think there was a specific complaint. And I, yeah. I think it may have been, um, a recommendation also that came out of the differential item analysis. Um, yeah, oh, yeah, it might yeah. have been that too. But we, I was going to say that we do get complaints about proctors. We, we don't really get complaints about graders because I don't think it's that visible to test takers. But we do get complaints about proctors. So that, you know, for what, whatever that's worth, we do get them. So I guess my question more is like, is there a way to, great, this has been implemented and it's happening, but to assess the fact whether it's working. Yeah. <laughs> and that may not exist and that's fine. Sometimes in DEI work, like you can't always, but is there a way to at least start to assess, assess what the data is saying around some of those complaints and sort of what that process was, assess the impact of the state bar training? Has it impacted what the makeup of graders look like compared to four or five years ago? Like, mm -hmm. can we just, something to, a compare and contrast even you know if we expanded these things what has now shifted the grading pool i don't know right well the changes the changing of the rules around who can be a grader and the mm -hmm. geographic thing i think well obviously but, yeah. yeah i don't know the answer uh, uh but that wouldn't necessarily be this committee's work like that would be in once another group would do that and then report back to us right like we wouldn't actually because so we don't have the the other data, right. you know, we're not getting the complaints and all like to be able to right. organize that. So I'm just wondering if it's like within because there are so many things shifting with the exam, like within the next five years, they should sort of 
embark on some study to, to have results to understand the impact five years after this being implemented. The next five years, you should be able to speak to uh, the efficacy or of the training or impact. Um, and then that helps to pick vendors and all that stuff. But that's our recommendation that as we move it off of our list that, you know, well, you can wrap some data around right. mm -hmm. the spend or whatever, however you know, justify it. Um, what's differential item analysis? I cannot explain it to you. Okay. It is um, mathy. how, how it is the mathy. analysis was done um, to determine whether the questions right. um, bias any particular group over right. another. Got it. It's a statistical analysis yes. of whether the, yeah. of the way of who answered the question what way and is there a statistical significance in yeah. the way the question was written that has you know uh an in that that the result of which is a bias one way or the other um to the test taker Got it. thank you both. Yeah. so yeah. i mean and we did maybe deep dive on that <laughs> you might so Leah, um, you know, Elizabeth, maybe it is still a strike through and this is just my like thought to Yummy's point that if it's the office of admissions or whatever mm -hmm. to just, we did a thing, what's the impact of it, right? Do and maybe help? we could get a report on that, sure. but I'm not saying we have to do that deep dive, but no. you know, not to create work for other offices, it's sorry. Well, we so have like been, and I, I think it's been reported to you, the, um, we have been tracking the diversity of the greater pool in particular. And I think that data has come your way and it has, um, I don't know that we did it retroactively to do a compare and contrast. Elizabeth, maybe you know, but I, I know. That, collecting it, so we couldn't. Yeah. That's what I was thinking but, prospectively. But we would be, we, we should be able to, because we have the bar numbers and we have, a lot of the um, race oh. and gender information from the admissions data set. So maybe that's something we can ask to do. Cause I, I know in the most recent analysis I saw, I was surprised by the diversity of the composition, pleasantly surprised. So um, I think we could actually try to look at this five years ago, just looking at bar numbers. So maybe okay. Elizabeth, that's something we can, we can do. Um, yeah. Okay. But I was going to say in response, I think it's really hard. I mean, we struggle with this as an employer, too, because we're doing a lot of implicit bias work internally. Yeah. What is the what's the outcome? Right. And we can do that through like culture assessments, which is what we do as part of like our annual like staff engagement surveys and whatnot. But um, I don't know how to to do that here. Maybe that's the same kind of thing looking ahead. We kind of see how people, how they feel about their experience, both serving as a proctor integrator and then those that they're proctoring. But I think it's really tricky to do that outcome analysis for training generally. Absolutely. We're not adding it. Visible. We're not going to add it, but we're going to look into reporting back some data to collapse in the future. Perfect. Sorry for creating such a thing around that. It's okay. <laughs> I love it. Good question. Okay. Um, similarly, this was related to outreach related to graders, um, because graders mm -hmm. um, um, are the pipeline to um, becoming a pre-tester for bar exam questions and, and then um, helping to develop bar exam questions. Um, and so COAF, I, I, we worked with admissions and COAF, uh, provided information to admissions on who would be, who to outreach to, to increase this pool. Um, and so um, because this has been implemented, I'm also recommending to strike this one. Yeah. I think this goes to my earlier part, and I just report back. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think, and if we have data now, it sounds like on what the graders look like that that may be you know um so this next item is related to recruitment and retention initiatives um, surrounding loan repayment assistance programs and loan forgiveness 
Um, and so uh, we've done an incredible amount of work on this. Um, thank you to Kristen and Heather. Um, and there currently are actually two statewide programs related to loan repayment assistance programs for public interest attorneys um, and legal aid attorneys specifically. Uh, one is administered by the California Access to Justice Commission, um, and the other is uh, a, a will be administered by the California Student Aid Commission. Um, so uh, I think at this juncture, uh, it, it's probably just monitoring. Yeah. And perhaps uh, when there is some data to report or some, yeah. It, yeah, I, I was the one who said we couldn't take it off. Okay. <laughs> I, I, did, I did take loan forgiveness off, but yeah. um, I can put it back in. I was going to ask why is I, that stricken but not loan repayment? Is it loan? I struck loan forgiveness because the two programs are loan repayment assistance programs oh yeah. um, that are statewide. And the loan forgiveness is federal. Yes, it's federal. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is uh, work with uh, this, the next item is uh, related to the law school accreditation process. Um, and um, Natalie Leonard from the Office of Admissions came to talk to COAF, uh, I believe in June about this. And I understand that work will move forward on this in 2024. And we already have a working group. I believe it's Kristen and Shalak. Or no. Yeah. I had volunteered for it. I think I it's, 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 I think it's, it was Sarah, Sarah, and yeah. then Sarah left. So yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it is Shalak. Okay. It's definitely me. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love me an accreditation issue. Okay. Um, this, these next set of activities are in goal three of the strategic plan related to regulating the legal profession. Um, the first one that I'm recommending that we strike is related to the imposter syndrome uh, resources that Alexa reported on earlier. Uh, we hope to have those published on the website um, soon. Um, and so, as we've done that work, we get a we gold star for that work. Do we not want to leave it on there until it's finished so we can check it off this year? It's, it's coming up, isn't it? Like going on the website? I think it'll be in January. Going in January. If it doesn't go, then we have to put it back. Yes. <laughs> oh, it would be um, good if we could give ourselves a gold star on stuff that we, instead of getting it taken off the work plan. <laughs> I know I've said that before, but. Or it goes into a list of accomplishments. Right. There should be a list of accomplishments. Well, there is. A, it's called Elizabeth's resume. No. Right. <laughs> and I was going to say it's called the DEI report to the legislature. That's that true. That's true. Year. We do submit that and it is. Yeah. And it is really impressive when you see it all in one place like that. <laughs> Um, and then the next item is related to the disrupting implicit bias online module that we will be updating um, yes. in 2024. And so I gave us a little bit of runway uh, to, to 2025 because developing these modules is no small feat. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that is the last item um, on our list. Okay. So that is our... Um... 2024 work plan as it stands now. Um, are there additional DEI? I, there's an entire list that Tristan and, and Shalot came up with of additional DEI initiatives um, that you want to add to the work plan. Um, those, those are in exploration mode currently. Okay. Is it? <laughs> Look at her shut that down. Because I was pulling it back up. Right, because she is shutting that down really quickly. Get it in the Excel sheet. But you put it right here <laughs> under additional DEI. That is always on our agenda. Right, if it is always. anybody has other ideas for discussion. That are not in the exploration stage. Because yeah. we can always yeah. explore. Right. Um, yes, But I, true. I, we, I, it would, uh, yeah, we must do our due diligence. Right. <laughs> do, do we want it? But do we want to add something that says something similar to evaluate best practices from other, what was what, we're calling it, innovative practices innovative from other practices industries from and other determine industries. if any of them should be added or adopted by COAF or further explored or something like that? Sure. Let me scroll back up to that. Where's a good place for that? Oh, was it? Well, yeah. uh -huh. I imagine that'll come up. Um, sort of naturally um 
particular, I'm thinking about in the seal process. <laughs> about naturally, but it's fine to put it in. I think it'll be there. Right there. Look, there it is. Okay, cool. Yes, right in there. Sorry. Okay. Nope, that's good. Okay. Okay, any, yeah, you're going to say something. Oh, I, was, I know we have to vote on it, but I was, I, I, I know, see, you didn't put that in here, but I remembered. No, it's not. You forgot, but I remembered. It's, Sorry. Yeah. it's not my first rodeo. Um, all right, anything else um, that we are ready to add that is not in the exploratory stage to our work plan? I can't actually see Novella. And, and is Anna Helgas there? Tara? There's Tara. I don't see any hands raised. I don't see others. Oh, Tara. Okay. All right. Good. Um, all right. Then, as as uh, if memory serves, and um, Elizabeth has reminded me, we need to um, vote on the work plan and approve the work plan. I move to approve the work plan so my, as edited by Elizabeth. Second. second. <laughs> I don't know who got in there first. I'll let you decide who seconded. We'll let Tristan say. All right, we'll let Tristan say. Because it's her first. It's her first time. It's her first time. Fine. Sorry, Sean. I'm just kidding. I have a lot of seconds on the record. <laughs> now, I'm sorry, Leah, did you have anything you wanted to add to this before we we voted on it? <laughs> no. I don't okay, want to give Elizabeth a heart attack. We'll, we'll, we'll have our other exploratory conversations offline. Okay. Well, <laughs> feel free to, to feel free to rope me into some of those exploratory conversations if you want. Oh yeah, no, I'm mostly joking, but I this triggered some thoughts for me. Okay, good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I guess my question was going to be: There's breath in there for the new initiatives that we come up like we can. The yeah. Imposter the syndrome, the videos, plan. right? Like we have breath. For yes. Yes. Doing yes. things that aren't explicitly stated in the yes. work plan. That's why we try to word it right. Broadly. Like like the imposter syndrome videos we're piloting exactly. right now. So if, if the pilot goes well, we we will be able to continue to exactly develop those. Yeah. Yeah. Does okay. that include um, reports? Like if we were looking at like research and reports and external resources. Yeah. Like if you wanted to hear about something or receive a presentation yeah. on something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We love to receive presentation. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we regularly do re receive information and presentations on items that aren't in here. Like yeah. earlier this year, we learned about the civility rules um, and other that were being proposed and that sort of thing. Um, so we try yeah. to bring, bring things to co-op as they come up. But this is like the work that, you know, various working groups would be mm -hmm. um, moving work forward on. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. We have a motion and a second, and we've had discussion. All right, so you can take a roll call vote now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Yemi? Yes. Novella? Yes. Tara? Yes. Tristan? Yes. Jezreel? Yes. Michael? Yes. Shalak? Yes. Angelica? Yes. Stephanie? Kristen? Yes. Okay. Motion carries. Thank you, everybody. So this, um, I believe, goes to the board in January for approval. Great. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you for all your hard work on that. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Leah, for uh, being here and joining in on that. You're welcome to stay. I know you came for this. Yeah, so. I'm top over. Everybody's doing their planning sessions today. So I... <laughs> I'm going Zoom to Zoom, but I really appreciate this and thank you guys for your great work and look for 2024 with Farkas Squared is going to be a big year. So um, <laughs> Farkas Squared, I like it. it. I yeah, I like Farkas Squared. Yeah, when you come up with it, Farkas Squared. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you guys. Bye. Thank you. Leah. I was just going Bye. there in my head. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. All right. Um, Pam has her hand up. Oh, Pam. Yes, Pam. Yeah, that meeting is happening. Sorry to interrupt again. Um, I have my own board meeting in six minutes, so I'm going to have to leave. But okay, um, do you want to? We were just moving on to liaison. If if it's okay right. with Gladys, and um, we can uh, take you now. Can you talk yes, fast? Yes, of course. I'll talk fast. Oh, thank you, Gladys. Okay. Um, so, and and one thing I want to kind of echo what Gladys said. We are uh, Cal Law has worked with CLA on a number of things in the past, and 
Uh, I'm hoping to do so in the future. I've met with Sheila Johnston just a couple weeks ago about some of the things that hopefully we can do together. Um, so what's happening at Cal Law? First of all, we just finished uh, regional meetings. I went to, we divided the state into eight different regions and had in-person meetings uh, in each of those areas with all of our, or anyone who could attend from high school through law school. Uh, they were very, you know, some were more um, engaged than others, but I thought they were all really good meetings. And some of them, like the the LA region, which uh, Shalak had been kind enough to host for us uh, before, um, they actually came in with lists of things they wanted to talk about this time. So they were, they're very, very engaged. Uh, Shalak, and I hold you responsible for all of that. That was a Sorry. great. Meeting. No, it was a great meeting. It was it was fun. Um, so we're trying to get more, um, or I'm trying at least to be more um, there for our partners to be more engaged and to get them to be more engaged with each other. And I think it's, we're making some progress there, so which is great. Um, in our meeting today, we're going to be voting on adding some new schools. One, um, a law school, another uh, ABA accredited law school has asked to join the pathway. And then we have seven community colleges, which have also asked to join. Um, I don't know exactly how the board is going to vote on all of those, but um, I'm actually hopeful that all of them will be joining us before our summit, which is in February. Uh, the summit was mentioned earlier by Shellac. She's, she's on our planning committee, and I'm grateful for that. It's a two-day program. It uh, This year is going to be held at UC Davis School of Law. Any of you interested in attending, we'd love to have you there. And I sent a note to um, our summit planning committee chair after um, the discussion just a few minutes ago about possibly COAF being um, involved in the in the program. So we'll we'll follow up on that. Um, other than that, that's probably all I have to say because it's now three minutes before my board meeting, so I should probably go. But thank you all so much. I'm, it's a good meeting and it's it's educational for me to just listen in. So thank you for letting me. Thanks, Pam. And I apologize because I'm supposed to be at that meeting, but I'm here. So, <laughs> so I apologize. I, no I can't problem. Be able to... <laughs> Can you I just chime places. in? It's, uh, Pam loves off just to really encourage new or returning um, board members. If you are able to attend any of the summit, it is incredibly inspiring to be reminded of why the work on recruitment and retention as a profession is so important and these young people are so dedicated to getting to law school and even more their faculty like the high school teachers and administrators the community college professors and administrators are deeply committed to their students getting to law school um in ways that make me regret giving some of them my cell phone number <laughs> so <laughs> If you can attend the summit, if you can support any of it, 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 it rejuvenates why you are committed to the profession. So I really and, encourage it if you can. Yeah, thank you, Shalak. And I and I have to say the regional meetings do the same for me. I mean, it's it's fun to just sit in a room with 15 or 20 educators who are just so excited to talk about what they can do for the students. So it's it's great. And thank you. And thank you, Shalak, for everything you do. I'll see you next time. Thanks, thank Right. Thank you. Okay. Can we get a link to like a description about the summit? Yeah. Do you want me to send it to you, Elizabeth? And you can circulate it. Thank you. I was just about to ask that. <laughs> we will get that link out to everyone. Uh, Gladys. Do we have to go back to six point one? Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, we did it. At Fifty percent. So. I did it. I wanted to share with you all. Oh, sorry. Let me stop sharing. Um, our civics engagement page. Let me get that up. Okay, here we go. Um, yeah, so we just revamped our civics education and outreach initiatives page. Um, so that is led by the civics um, engagement and outreach committee. Um, and what we have is the lawyers in the classroom program. Uh, some of you may you know, already be familiar with it. Um, we take uh, lawyers and judges into the classroom um, to conduct civic education programs and primarily on days that are, you know, civics related. So 
um, May 1st, Law Day, and September 17th, Constitution Day. Um, so we just uh, revamped this webpage to make it more user-friendly for folks. So it has information on um, civics education um, as a whole. So, um, you know, the statewide initiatives and um, Chief Justice Guerrero's um, priority, you know, investing in civics education and our collaborations with various associations. And then we have a list here of the uh, K through 12 civics presentations. So we have um, a comic book, that's a publication that um, folks can request at any point in time, but we do use that when we do the No Animals Allowed presentation. Um, that one is recommended for K through five. Um, and students learn about just like the role of, you know, an attorney and a judge through illustrated examples. So that pairs really well with our uh, No Animals Allowed presentation um, and activity that uh, focuses more on the branches, the three branches of the government. Um, and that's recommended for students uh, grade three, uh, third through fifth. And then we have a toolkit um, for the 19th Amendment. So that covers the women's suffrage movement. Um, and we did revamp that to be more um, include diverse uh, leaders, including um, black and uh, women of color uh, within the movement. So that's uh, definitely been revamped. And uh, we uh, hope to promote that also during Women's History Month. Um, so then we also just got a new presentation on the bill making process that's for grades seven through 10. Um, and it's a wonderful presentation. Um, it has videos and activities um, and it features state legislators that explain um, how um, the bill making process works. So, you know, kind of from idea to the committees to the governor signing a veto and then, you know, students can do an activity to you know, in their classroom to take on that role and, and create a bill themselves and get it passed. And then um, there's a When You Turn 18 brochure. Um, we discussed that we're gonna uh, just kind of keep that publication for next year and work on revising it to, you know, update the laws and resources information and then have a new uh, When You Turn 18 brochure for 2025. So we are planning on including more information around like, you know, foster youth right or, uh, maybe like undocumented students, right? So we're we're gonna form a committee, spend some more time to revamp that. Uh, we also have another new um, presentation and video series that's really great too, in collaboration with our criminal law section, which is a uh, youth interactions with law enforcement. So that's for students age um, eight through eighteen. Um, and so I will, you know, I'll be sharing this information with you all as well as the the presentation, so you all can take a look at that. Um, we also have a flyer um, that we created. So we have more marketing materials now. And um, our goal is for next year to do um, 100 presentations on each day, on each of those two, you know, significant dates um, across California. So we'll definitely need, you know, volunteers and support um, to get folks out there in the classroom. And then, um, oh yeah, another goal too that I wanted to mention is that we want to meet with the school districts. They have um, civic engagement liaisons, um, coordinators and departments because they have the um, the California State Seal of Civic Engagement. So students can get that when, um, you know, that seal on their diploma and transcript, um, recognizing that they have an understanding of, you know, civics knowledge and they do a, um, a project or they write a paper. So um, we're meeting with them to have our content align with that um, with that, so it could be maybe be a requirement or at least like a resource that students can use um, to help them with those projects. So uh, we're working with the Department of Education on that. And then um, as far as law student programs, we have um, as a whole, CLA offers fellowships, scholarships, writing competitions, uh, networking summer mixers, pathways, webinars, events. Um, and right now what we have is the antitrust section has a diversity and inclusion fellowship. Um, this is our third year doing this fellowship. It's a six week um, internship at the Department of Justice office. And uh, the students receive a $10,000 stipend for participating. They also okay. receive mentorship um, and they really focus on trying to help students get a job um, after they complete this fellowship. So that's the program that we have, you know, actively going right now. 
Um, the applications are due January 12th. Um, we just had a Pathways event, a webinar um, this week, actually, and it was Pathway into Antitrust Law. So we're doing that for each of the sections, um, Pathway into, you know, Family Law or Pathway into, you know, the practice areas of the law where they they come, they have a panel of diverse attorneys talking about their personal journey in that area of law, and then more like information very specific about what they would expect day to day, you know, being in that field, different types of jobs. Um, and it kind of serves also as like a meet the section. So they also get like direct, you know, connection with those attorneys. Um, that way, you know, if there's any mentorship opportunities or whatever programs that specific section offers, you know, they get um, connected with them. So um, yeah, and in a nutshell, that's just, that's what we have going on right now. Great, thanks Gladys. And, you know, please let us know um, uh, if there are things that, that COA can partner uh, with you on. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Uh, any questions for Gladys? All right, judge. Last, but, but not least. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I will be very brief. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let me update you all on our October meeting for um, the Advisory Committee on Providing Access and Fairness for the Judicial Council. At our October meeting, um, Judge Elizabeth Macias, who is a judge of the Superior Court in the County of Orange, and she is also the chair of our ad hoc racial justice working group, she presented to our committee the new online racial justice toolkit. So the toolkit is a compilation of resources for bench officers, trial court leadership, and court staff to find guidance and a launching point to incorporate racial diversity, equity, and inclusion into their court operations. Um, it can also be used to train and educate staff and can be used to develop and sustain a diverse workforce, build effective community partnerships, and increase public trust. So it will function as an online hub where our users um, will go to locate empirical studies, practice guides, third party affiliate links to local nonprofit organizations and accredited educational institutions that are already engaged in racial justice initiatives in their local communities. And the toolkit will be continuously updated as new information and data reports and resources become available over time. Um, users of the site are going to be able to submit comments and feedback or suggestions of content to the working group um, via the Access and Fairness Committee, um, and that's going to be regular, regularly monitored by um, Judicial Council staff. So the process that happens next is that the toolkit um, through a report will be presented to the Judicial Council at our upcoming meeting in January of 2024. And um, once approved there, it will be launched and the link will be uh, shared and made publicly available. And if I have any sort of tech uh, ability, I'll share like Gladys did the, the link uh, for you all to see, um, but it, it will go through that approval process in January. So that was our work as of late. That's great. it for my report. That's great work. Thank you. Any uh, questions for the judge on yeah. that? <laughs> yes. Can we see the toolkit? Um, I don't know that it's been published yet. It has to go through um, the Judicial Council um, approval. So as soon as it's up, I will share the link. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for the judge? No, seeing none. Thank you for hanging in, so, liaisons especially because we always put you at the end of the agenda, and so you have to sit through the rest of the stuff we do before we get to you. So thank you for that. Um, anything else, as it uh, according to my agenda, uh, we have nothing else. It, anybody else have anything they want to talk about before we adjourn today? I am seeing none. No, nothing. All right, then do I need a motion? Oh, I don't. I don't need a motion. All right. Well, then, um, thank you all for being here in person and virtually today um, and for hanging uh, with us as we um, got, went through our agenda for the last four hours. Um, 
And I look forward to seeing you all at our next meeting, which is, I don't know when. March 14th, I think. Um, I will be sending out the 2024 meeting dates um, short uh, with a kind of the email, post-meeting email with all the PowerPoints, uh, the link to the law school profile report, um, the COAF co co roster, um, and links a link to the CLA civic engagement site, um, as well as the uh, Pathway Summit. Um, so I'll be sending that out. And as a reminder, the March meeting is virtual for everybody. We will be together again uh, in June, I believe is our plan, mm -hmm. on a date that Elizabeth will share with us in an email yes. later on in the next couple of days. Maybe not today. Uh, all right. Um, thank you all for being here. Lovely to see you all. Have a nice weekend. Uh, and we'll, we'll see you next time. Yeah. Happy holidays. Happy, Happy holidays, holidays, everybody. Happy holidays. Hope to see you all in person.